everyone. You're welcome to the virtual edition of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association annual lecture and AGM. We're delighted to have you here. And um, in the spirit of the season we're in, we have, we have to go virtual. And I'm sure we're all used to having Zoom events now. I am Olusheyi Adejuibe, and I'll be the anchor for this event. I am the Financial Secretary of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association. I would like to say a special welcome to our special guests of honor, the Honorable Justice. Honorable Justice J.T. Soho, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, who is ably represented by my Lord Justice A.O. Faji of the Lagos Division of the Federal High Court. We also have Madam Adiza Bala Usman, who is ably represented by Mr. E.D. Kabir. And we have a keynote speaker in the person of the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Shippers Council, Mr. Asan Belo. And may I request that all delegates mute their phones at this time. And um, if you're not talking or you're not speaking or participating, could you kindly mute your phone so we can have a seamless event? Um, we're going to have the annual lecture and um, the keynote address will be given. And then there'll be a panel, a session of um, panelists. We've got a well, we have seasoned professionals to take, uh, to take uh, us into the breakdown session. And afterwards, we would have the question and answer, and then we would wrap up. So I want to, I, I welcome you all to this virtual AGM, and I'm sure it will be a very productive time. Before we go on, I would like us to stand up for the national anthem, please. The national anthem. <laughs> invite the president of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, Mr. Chidi Ilogu, SAN, to give us his welcome remarks. Mr. Chidi Ilogu is a senior partner at Foundation Chambers, and he has over 40 years of experience in legal practice. He holds a master's degree in maritime law from Cardiff Law University, Cardiff Law School, University of Wales and he was admitted to the inner bar as a senior advocate of Nigeria in July, 2012. He is a fellow of the Institute of the Chartered Arbitrators UK. He's a consultant to the IMO and the Association of International Petroleum Negotiations. He is a president of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association and sits on the board of the Maritime Arbitrators Association of Nigeria. Mr. Chidi Ilogu has served as a member of the Transport Schematic Working Group for Division 2020 Committee and is a chairman of the Federal Ministry of Transport Poor Reforms Evaluation Committee. He is the author of Essays on Maritime Law and Practice and Foundation of Carriage of Goods by C, the Nigerian Perspective. Mr. President, sir. Good morning, our distinguished special guests, my lords, our own there, Mr. Hassan Bello, 
who is our guest lecturer for today, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and my learned colleagues, you are all welcome to this very auspicious event. I say auspicious because it has produced certain approaches such as what we're having now, this virtual meeting, to meet with the challenges of the times. And so you're all very specially welcome to this uh, annual lecture and which will be followed with an annual general meeting in the afternoon as we all share thoughts on very, tri very um, topical issues such as we shall have this morning on the role of automation in the Nigerian shipping cluster. Please relax and join me as we undertake this adventure together. Happy sailing. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Ilogu, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. May I now call on Mrs. Funke Agbo, SAN, the first vice president of NMLA and the chairperson of the AGM. Mrs. Funke Agbo, SAN, has extensive experience in admiralty law, shipping and marine insurance law and litigation, shipping registration, cabotage registration, compliance, ship finance and securitization and international trade law and commercial arbitration. Mrs. Agbo is an authority in the industry, having graduated from the University of Lagos and subsequently obtaining an LLM from the University College London. She was admitted to the Nigerian Bar in 1982, and she's a member of various organizations, including being the first vice president of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, the past president of WISTA. Mrs. Agbo SAN is a CEDA accredited mediator and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. She is a respected maritime lawyer and a key member of ACASI's dispute resolution practice. She's recognized for her deep expertise in shipping and maritime disputes. This is by the Chamber's Global Guide 2014 and 2015, respectively. Leonard Silk. Thank you very much. On behalf of the planning committee of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, I add our thanks to the thanks of the uh, president uh, for all of you being here. We are excited about our annual lecture this year. And what we want to speak about, as you all know, is the role of automation in the development of the Nigerian shipping cluster. Uh, this issue is really top, front and center globally, the issue of automation. And we thought that this would be a good topic to discuss at this annual lecture at this time. Uh, fortunately, well, or I don't know whether it's fortunately or unfortunately, it's virtual. And therefore, we are able to get um, the best possible speakers to dissect this particular issue across sectors. We talk about the Nigerian sleeping cl cluster. What is that? At its core in Nigeria, the shipping cluster consists of owners and operators of shipping, of ships, tankers, includes providers of maritime services such as technical consultants, ship brokers, ship agents, specialized legal services, specialized lenders in financial services for the maritime sector, marine equipment suppliers, postal shipping provide, uh, provi um, uh, service providers, offshore contracting, the ports, the Navy, the Coast Guard, shipbuilding and ship repairs, trade facilitation and revenue collection as we have in the Nigerian Customs Service. And of course, we have maritime education, training, and as well as the regulators. Our regulators, NIMASA, the Nigerian Shippers Council, MPA, NIWA, and even the Lagos State Transport Services are all part of the maritime cluster. And it's important that our roles, the roles of all the participants in this cluster are regulated, are coordinated, 
uh, and also such that we get the best possible outcome for Nigeria. We are a little behind, even the shipping industry world over recognizes as far as automation and digitalization is concerned, the shipping world is a little behind. It's a traditional sector and therefore it takes time to change. But change we must. The direction of the digital age is forward. We cannot afford to be left behind. So it's important that we begin to talk about it and we have the best piece of people possible to do so. We have the executive secretary, CEO of the Nigerian Shippers Council, who is at the forefront of driving this issue of automation. Automation technology is primed to make the provision of shipping services for the Nigerian consumer, for the Nigerian exporter, for the Nigerian importer, for the Nigerian person in whatever part of the cluster. And even the people that support the industry are supposed to make it cheaper. And hopefully, if we all get together, begin this discussion and drive it forward, we will begin to see the path forward. I believe that we have speakers here who are going to help us shine a light on how we should do so. And I think um, Mr. Hassan Bello is well primed to do so. So we are thankful that he's here to drive that process forward. And we have also with us the deputy controller, a deputy controller in the Nigerian Customs Service, Mr. Dera Nadi, who will be speaking to us from their perspective in terms of automation and cargo clearance in Nigeria. And we have our regulate, one of our um, regulators, Mrs. Neka Obianyo, um, our registrar of ships um, out of the Nigerian Marit, Nigerian, uh, out of Nimasa, who will be telling us how they want to drive the process of, tech, of technology and automation in the ship registry, which is an important uh, part of the cluster. And we have also uh, Mrs. Adebankia Kimboboye, Group Legal Counsel for Lorry Transport and Logistics, who will help us dissect the legal issues surrounding the supply chain as of logistics. And of course, we have our moderator, Mr. Adedoye, who will take us through the presentation of the panelists. So thank you once again, um, Honorable Justice Soho, ably represented by Honorable Justice Faji, one of ours, and Mrs. Hadiza Bala Usman, the Managing Director of Nigerian Ports Authority, both of whom have given their good messages um, shortly. And we thank both of you for your time. Uh, and of course, um, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Bala Usman is rep duly represented by our good friend, Mr. Edi Kabir, who we know very well. Thank you all very much. And please let us enjoy a good lecture. Thank you so very much. The special guest of honor for this annual lecture is the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, Honorable Justice J.T. Soho, but he will be ably represented by Honorable Justice A.O. Faji of the Lagos Division of the Federal High Court. Honorable Justice A.O. Faji was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1986 and he practiced law for 16 years before his elevation to the Federal High Court bench. He did some work in Admiralty and Marine Insurance. He was appointed a judge of the Federal High Court in 2002. He became a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators UK in 2007 and has served in six divisions of the Federal High Court. He is a regular contributor at the Biennial Maritime Seminar for Judges. May I invite my Lord Honorable Justice A.O. Faji to give us his goodwill message on behalf of the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court. Lord... The President of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, Mr. Chidi Logu, the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Shippers Council, Mr. Hassan Bello, the Managing Director of the Nigerian Ports Authority, Hajia Hadiza Bala Usman, represented by Mr. Kabir, members of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will start by apologizing for the absence of our Chief Judge, the Honorable Justice John Tehemba Soho, 
who is unavailably absent. Um, he sends his greetings and his regards and is very grateful for this invitation. I'll read his speech. So the voice you will hear is my voice, but the speech is the chief judge's speech. Let me start by congratulating the Nigerian Maritime Law Association on its 11th annual general meeting. The relationship between the Federal High Court and the NMLA is not just a passing one. Indeed, the former chief judge of the court was a past president of the NMLA. We therefore remember with due respect the Honorable Justice Babatunde Mahmoud Belgore. The efforts of past members and leaders of the association have thus not been in vain. The NMA NMLA has continued to be a strong voice in the development of maritime law and practice. At the Federal High Court, we have enjoyed the impute of the NMLA, particularly when important developments take place in maritime law and practice. Members of the association have constituted an important source of faculty for the Biennial Maritime Seminar for Judges, organized by the Shippers Council and the Strategic Admiralty Law Seminars, organized by NIMASA. May I at this juncture add that quite a number of members of this faculty are silks, Mr. Louis Mbanefo, Otumbo Duba, Chifi Dou, Professor Bolo and Elias, Paul Lusoro, Chidi Logu, Femi Atoyebi, Babaji De Koku, Olubide Shofora, Dr. Ola Wain, Emmanuel Achuku, Funke Agbo, and now Jean Chiazo, Anishere. It is our hope that in due course, the NPA, which is powerfully represented at this event by its managing director, will consider a collaboration with the NMLA and the National Judicial Institute by taking part in the development of maritime law and practice by organizing its own seminar. We are receptive to such an idea. The topic of this year's AGM is apt, the role of automation and technology in the development of the Nigerian shipping cluster. This is not the first time a look will be taken into the role of technology and things digital in maritime practice. Previous maritime seminars for judges and the AGM of 2018 of 2017 addressed issues relating to electronic bills of lading and the Bolero system, as well as electronic evidence. Today, we are in a new normal foisted, foisted upon us by COVID-19. You may see this focus as one of the positives of COVID-19. We now have to do more things with less direct human intervention. The Federal High Court has always been forward looking in its rules. The rules of courts of 2009 established an e-registry, that is a communications center for e-filing, see order 59 of the new rules of 2019. This system runs parallel with the existing system and is in its formative stage. COVID-19 has made it more imperative to resort to virtual hearings. It must be stated that before the COVID-19, the Federal High Court had been conducting virtual proceedings by teleconference. Indeed, seven courts in the Lagos Judicial Division are equipped with teleconferencing facilities provided by the Joint Task Force on Modern Slavery of the British Deputy High Commission. There are stenograph facilities and audio recording systems in those seven courts. Just as in every human endeavor, virtual hearings have their own drawbacks. There is the challenge of internet access, particularly in the rural areas. This is not peculiar to Nigeria because even England has a similar situation in its rural areas where internet access is not reliable. There is the issue of power. The issue of witness coaching is one which it has been suggested can be whittled down by the use of 360 degree cameras. The issue, however, is availability of such facilities. The issue of admission of bulk documentary exhibits, how will oath be taken? What if the witness is to see and identify the parties? The issue of real evidence and visits to locals in court. There is also microphone discipline and remote hearing advocacy. The Supreme Court has ruled that remote hearing is constitutional and that judges must act. I have held a number of remote hearings from trial to judgment in cases involving documents and usually by way of motions and originating motions. The challenge of internet access, particularly in places where there is poor access or poor reception, however, looms large. Virtual proceedings are held with the consent of parties who request for it in writing. The registry sends the invite and sets up the courtroom. Parties are responsible for their own access and must be online throughout the proceedings. There is a test run 10 minutes before proceedings start. My own practice is to sit in court with the doors open, but with the rules of mask wearing and social distancing being followed. I do not allow more than 20 people, including counsel in my courtroom. I see all the parties and counsel and they all see each other. 
by control, the judge controls the proceedings and holds same once it is clear that one of the parties is not connected. The judge sits with technical IT personnel in attendance. That is as regards court proceedings. There is an urgent need for digital case management systems. This will reduce corruption, increase efficiency and accountability. It reduces human intervention and frees up physical space, which can be useful as remote hearing rooms. There is also the need for a built digital platform to judiciary to guard against hacking and of compromise in maritime law in 2019 in Nigeria. That is the promulgation of the Suppression of Piracy and Other Maritime Offenses Act of 2019. This act incorporates the various conventions on suppression of unlawful activities at sea. It is not in dispute that incidents of piracy in the Gulf of Guinea have overtaken other regions, including the Horn of Africa. The promulgation of this act is therefore most welcome. Our development partners have also been assisting in training judges, prosecutors, and investigators. A simulated piracy hearing was conducted in October 2020. The UNODC also organized a webinar on the use of IT solutions in criminal proceedings with a view to expediting criminal proceedings. The first piracy case in the Gulf of Guinea is currently ongoing at the Federal High Court, Lagos. I think the imperative of collaboration cannot be better exemplified than through today's event. I congratulate the NMA, NMLA for the work it is doing. I thank you for the honor of being allowed to share my thoughts with such a distinguished audience. I wish you fruitful deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my Lord, Honorable Justice A. O. Faji, for the CJ's address. Thank you. I will now call on the Managing Director, our special guest of honor at this year's annual lecture, the MD of the Nigerian Port Authority, Mrs. Adiza Bala Usman. She is unavoidably absent and will be her speech will be read on behalf on her behalf by Mr. E. D. Kabir. Adiza Bala Usman is an alumnus of Amadou Bello University, Zaria, where she earned a bachelor's degree in business administration and of the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom, where she obtained a postgraduate degree in development studies. Before her appointment on the 11th of June, 2016, as the first female managing director of the NPA in its 63 years of existence, Adiza Bala Usman worked at the BPE, after which she was hired by the UNDP for the Federal Capital Territory Administration as assistant to the Minister on Project Implementation. A receiver of many awards in the areas of governance, girl child education, and women emancipation, Bala Usman is the Vice President African Region for the International Association of Ports and Arbors. For the third time, the IMO on the 2nd of October, 2020, unanimously elected Mrs. Adiza Bala Usman as a vice chair of the facilitation committee for the 2020-2021 biennium. She is currently pursuing an aggressive 25-year port development plan that will prepare the NPA for the future of the global maritime industry. May we have Mr. Kabir? The President, the Executive Secretary of Nigerian Shippers Council, Mr. Atambello, special guest of honor, every represented by the Justice uh, Faji, the executive, executive committee members of Nigerian Maritime Law Association. My name is Mr. Edward Dauda Kabir. I'm here to represent the managing director of Nigerian Port Authority, who is unavoidably absent. She would have loved to deliver the message herself, but uh, she has other national assignments. She now delegated me to represent her in this forum. Good morning. 
with the permission of Mr. President, may I kindly read the address? But if you hear I, it means Hadith Dabala Osman, not Kabir. Thank you. It gives me a great pleasure to join members of the Nigeria Maritime Law Association at the 2020 edition of your annual lecture with the theme, The Role of Automation in the Development of Nigeria's Shipping Cluster. I want to appreciate the leadership of the association for the choosing this theme, which is central to the success of the maritime industry. Automation will not just bring our industry at par with what operates in other countries, it will also deal with the evil of corruption by eliminating opportunities for rent seeking and increasing service delivery and efficiency in our operations. The theme is undeniably valuable to the future of the maritime industry, particularly in attaining the target of federal government for 48 hour cargo clearance, increased revenue generation, detection of trade malpractices and trade facilitation. The automation of operation will also aid the boosting of exports, foreign exchange earnings, as well as the tackling of insecurity. It is therefore gratifying that the Nigeria Maritime Law Association is joining this important conversation on the need for automation. It is not entirely surprising though, given the importance of a governing body of laws to the structure and effective operation of the maritime industry. Since that, since that the industry is global with a lot of lot operations carrying out on the sea, the importance of uniform and standard procedure guiding all operating countries cannot be overemphasized. The realization of this is why the Nigerian Power Authority has always placed a premium on its relationship with and commitment to the affairs of the Nigeria Maritime Law Association. From the onset, the current management of Nigerian Port Authority identified three pillars of excellence to anchor its programs. These are people, technology, and infrastructure. We have gone all the way to prioritize the three areas. In the sphere of technology, which is the focus of this lecture, we have introduced a number of processes which have increased transparency and efficiency. Some of the initiatives that have helped improve the automation of our processes include revenue invoice management system, PRIMS, electronic ship entry notice, ESEN, command control communication and intelligence center, C3I, and the port single window, which is in progress. We are also at the verge of unveiling and commissioning the truck's electronic call-up system, which will address the menace of congestion being experienced by indiscriminate parking of trucks along the port corridor. I must also add that we are always keen to work with other stakeholders in the revenue chain, including Nigerian Maritime Law Association, to achieve the important milestone of complete of complete automation of, pro of processes. I do hope that this event will further motivate us all to work towards work to harder and this goal in the interest of our country. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as you settle down to go into session of this lecture, I once again congratulate the association. I call on all participants to open their minds to elaborate discussions that may bring up initiatives capable of repositioning our industry. I wish you a very pleasant and fruitful deliberation. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you much, Mr. Kabir, for the goodwill message from the MD of the Nigerian Ports Authority. Moving on with the lecture, The theme, as we all know, for this annual lecture is the role of automation in the development of the Nigerian shipping cluster. And we have a keynote speaker in the person of the executive secretary and the chief executive officer of the Nigerian Shippers Council, 
Mr. Hassan Bello. Mr. Hassan Bello is the Executive Secretary and CEO of the Nigerian Shippers Council. As a lawyer, he joined the council in 1998 as a Deputy Director and Head of Legal Services. He became a director in the same department, the position which he held for many years before his appointment as the CEO. Before he joined the council, Mr. Bello had worked with the Sokoto State Ministry of Justice and the State's Investment Company Limited, where he rose to become the acting MD CEO. Mr. Bello is a fellow of the Arbitration Council of Nigeria, is a council member of the IMO, is a council member of the Provisional Enabling Business Environment Council, and the Maritime Lawyers Association, among others. May I invite Mr. Asan Bello to deliver his keynote address? Good morning. The President of the Nigeria Maritime Law Association, our ever hardworking erudite, Mr. Chidu Ilo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, even though I have given it a tutorsy title which is yet to receive, I call him chief. I am the only one who has the license to do that. Um, the chief judge of the Federal High Court, here represented by Honorable Justice Olayin Kafaji, who is also uh, of the unofficial uh, admiralty bench of the Federal High Court. Um, the managing director of Nigerian ship, uh, Nigerian Ports Authority, uh, Mrs. Hadiza, Ms. Hadiza Bala Osman, here represented by my friend uh, Edward Kabiru, uh, members of the Maritime Law Association um, and uh, other resource persons. I'm very happy to be invited. Uh, here for this very important occasion. It is pleasing to see the constant, the constant uh, uh, involvement of lawyers, especially in the maritime sector, to the development of that sector. I think we can do more if we are allowed to. I've always had this philosophy that once there is a party and you feel you belong to, you are either invited, in which case you go with your invitation card, but even if you are not invited and you feel your interest is there, you should get crushed. I think the maritime lawyers should get crushed into many things that's happening in Nigeria as far as the maritime sector is concerned. Uh, the international trade uh, is running faster than the law could catch with it. We have had innovations, door-to-door -door delivery of cargo, electronic or e-commerce. And I think the law is puffing behind, trying to catch up with the modern trends. The infusion of technology and so many other things have revolutionized even within 20 years, you know, international trade. And uh, the, uh, legal profession must, as a matter of urgency, catch up with this thread, or we have the risk, you know, of being omitted altogether. And that's why when I see this topic, I was so happy with it. The innovation created by Nigeria Maritime Law Association is now making the industry come uh, face to face um, the law to come face to face with the industry and not only to observe or to wait until incidents happen to go to court or arbitration, but to actually shape it. I think lawyers should shape most of what's happening. Um, when uh, Lana Silk, uh, Mrs. Funke Agbo was also talking about the clusters, I heard her mention an array of profession, including intelligentsia, but Maybe because we are shy, I didn't hear her say lawyers. But lawyers must be involved at all times. Uh, 
uh, it is important, therefore, that we get involved, we get um, always there like we are doing now. Uh, the role of automation and technology in the development of Nigerian shipping cluster, the topic, you know, put me slightly off when, uh, I mean, the, I was trying to see technology and cluster and um, what is, you know, shipping cluster generally. So I found it interesting, the definition given by Professor Michael Potter, and this is what he said. He said, a cluster as a geographically proximate group of interconnected companies and associated institutions in a particular field linked by uh, commonalities, uh, complementaries, that is external uh, economies. So Funke Abu has also defined that. Uh, she mentioned shipping, seaports, marine equipment, Navy, shipbuilding, fishery, academia, Navy, and so many other things. So, but first of all, before we even think of clusters, I think it is important we become aware of our maritime domain. Are we really conscious of our domain as a maritime um, you know, space? Because most Nigerians, maybe because shipping is done at agency level, don't realize the importance of maritime to the economy. But maritime, I think, more than even oil and gas, is strategic to the economy of a nation. It defines the nation's ambition. It defines the nation's aspiration. And here we are now in this era of diversification of source of revenue for the economy. It is important that conscious effort is made to understand and appreciate our maritime domain first. I think this has not been done and it behoves on the operators and the regulators and the lawyers to look at what this maritime domain is, what it represents locally and internationally. It is important that we become conscious of it. So if we determine that a, a cluster, geographically proximate group of interconnected companies, do we have that cluster in Nigeria? Does it really exist? Interrelated companies consciously, uh, deliberately, you know, working in interrelationship to produce what is known as the maritime economy or the, uh, 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 the source of revenue for Nigeria. I doubt, and the functions of the government is to look at this issue. The government, for example, has suffered from uh, this uh, uh, mono economy of gas and oil. It has seen that it is not reliable. It has seen that it is not predictable. It has seen that it is not certain. The government cannot even present a budget based on this um, sector of the economy. And so we have to look at either options or alternatives. But necessity will have to say, look inwards, because everybody is now looking inwards. Uh, you have to be inward to be strong economically. I can imagine if during the COVID, when the rise fields of Thailand, uh, Vietnam, where nobody was working the rice field, how we will have escaped the food security or insecurity if we have not, you know, come down to look at our own economy and produce rice locally. So it is important, first of all, we, be, we are uh, aware of our potentialities. We are aware of our opportunities. We are aware of our possibilities. But I've been to many lectures where it is real. Nigeria, 80,000 uh, kilometers of uh, show, uh, 925,000 square kilometers, estuaries, rivers, creeks, you know, and so on and so forth. But so what? So what? What does it mean? It depends on the contribution you make to the GDP. And everybody sits at the table now and said, this is what I've brought. Communications will come and say, this is what I've brought to the table. 
settlement of dispute will say, this is what I've saved and this is what I'm contributing. Nollywood will come and say, this is the employment I've made. This is the tax I'm paying. This is my contribution you know, to the GDP. The maritime industry, shipping, will also have to come and say, this is what I have brought to the table. So it's very important for government to, to structure the maritime uh, cluster to be led by the private sector. I have not seen that deliberateness because a cluster is a link, you know, when all these uh, aspects or all these subsectors mentioned by Funke Agu come together deliberately and cohabit so that we can have maximum uh, utilization of our maritime domain and contribute to the economy. I'm thinking of uh, the Lekki Free Zone, for example. Uh, Lekki Free Zone, uh, it uh, provides a lot of opportunities, business opportunities, diversified of opportunities. I think it's a catalyst, an enabler, uh, because the Lekki Deep Seaport is situated you know, in that uh, domain. And uh, we have geographical uh, closeness, even though that may not be necessary with technology now. You know, but this is where it's a, a kind of ecosystem where people cohabit with maritime taking the lead, harnessing, unifying, and bringing everybody together. So we have to talk of integration. We have to talk now. We build infrastructure, even the maritime infrastructure, without coordination or integration, and that is uh, really not bringing it together. If you know what I mean, a cluster must be a deliberate effort to rein in the main maritime industry and the associated service, so that we can all work together and realize uh, a deliberate economy. Um, we have, uh, for example, at Lekki, not only the Lekki Free Zone, not only the Lekki Deep Sea Board, but we have Dangote Refinery and Fertilizer. We have uh, so many uh, things, uh, industries coming together. I think that could be, you know, the embryonic uh, cluster we are talking about. And the government and the regulators and the private sector must come and realize it as such. If we are talking about the Silicon Valley, that is what I may call a cluster. That is uh, information technology in that place. Certainly, it also breeds a lot of uh, you know, industries coming together and you could see the effect. I'm talking about the, even the Me Medicon Valley, which is biotech. That is you know, another cluster. You know, uh, in other countries, of course, they have shipping tradition for as long as anybody can remember, like Greece. This shipping cluster or maritime cluster is the saver of the Greece economy. Now, even the Rotterdam port itself, you know, it's also a cluster in the sense that it employs a lot of people, it creates, that is jobs. It also have diversified industries that are linked with it. So the industries we have in Nigeria are not deliberately, and that's my, my problem. There must be some deliberate, concerted, conscious effort to say if we are producing pipes, for example, or if we are going to build crafts, leisure crafts, or we have leisure, uh, uh, vacation, tourism around Lekki, all this must come together in a symbiotic relationship as much as we could so that there is supervision, coordination, uh, and a, a kind of, you know, force, a very large force that will produce so many things for Nigeria. Um, then technology, of course, is not given. Uh, I'm happy Nigerian Ports Authority, they are the pioneers of this technology uh, not more than three or four years ago, and you had the representative reeling out 
so many things. What he didn't say is that the introduction of that technology has changed the way we do business. Before one has to go to many banks, you know, pay for services, you know, of uh, MBA, then he gets receipts and then go to another bank in Sunday. Before you do that, maybe five days before. But with what MPA has produced, there's only one central payment and that's has saved time and cost. We have to look at the port as the potential for that cluster. Ports must be deliberate. I've always said it. Nigerian ports cannot be ports for port's sake. They must represent something. They must have characters and characteristics. You just don't build an infrastructure and just leave it. Infrastructure are supposed to be connected. They must be whispering or talking or shouting at the case maybe to one another. If I have cargo in the ports, for example, I'll have to call a dry port in Kaduna. What space do you have? Okay, these trucks are coming. Oh, the rail is leaving. And this is all a function of technology. A port that is not technology driven, it's not a port, but it's a waterfront. Technology is the one that will mesmerize investors. It is the one that will enable us to conduct businesses. I will always, maybe to, uh, uh, with the risk of sounding very boring, make the examples of the banks. I said three years ago, you go to the banking hall, you struggle, you sweat. Some even have to pay a bribe for them to come and transact business. But what happened? What do you see at the banking hall now? There's nobody there because you use your phone to move, to move billions of dollars. The same thing we should use our phones to move billion tons of cargo from the port. No need for you to go to the port to clear your cargo. The port must be digital. The port must be contactless. That is the beginning of efficiency, transparency, transparency and accountability. And of course, predictability. There are so many things we need to do. It will take us you know, many uh, hours to talk about. But it is investment. It is the economy. We can no more have romanticized, uh, you know, issue of the, uh, uh, of the maritime industry. Maritime industry is nothing but what it can bring. Uh, during, uh, may, may, may God uh, rest his soul, Justice Bergore, uh, the former uh, chief judge of the Federal High Court, very, very, uh, what I'll call the father of activism, you know, in the maritime industry. We had this argument, I was a rookie uh, in the industry, and we are all talking about the contestation between the Hamburg and the Hague rules. And of course, you know, Justice Bergori doesn't joke with the Hamburg rules. You know, he says it's cargo interest. And then one day I ask him, my Lord, why can we, how can we be cargo interest all the time? Don't we have our ambition to also be, you know, uh, a ship? owning and operating nation, then he said in his characteristic way, I ah, wait until we get there. So it is important we look at the dynamics of that. I'm talking about consciousness. We do things without coordination, without integration, and everyone is to himself, and God is for us all. This has to change. I want the intervention the central bank has been given to several sectors of the economy. Uh, agriculture, um, mining, central bank should look the other way and look at the maritime industry. There is no place better for diversification than the maritime economy. Uh, Lannistic Olisa Abakoba always talk about seven trillion. That means financing uh, or in the maritime and financing, you know, the budget, you know, well over. And again and again. And I think we have to really do that. But technology is the way to start. We have institutions apart from the MPA. I'm impressed with what Nigerian custom is doing about technology. They are developing what is called the e-customs. And when that is redeployed, you will see that we cut the process of clearance of the goods. Averagely, it's seven days in West and Central African region for dwell time of cargo. In Nigeria, we are doing 21. We have to reduce that. But again, the government has to come. For all the efficiency of the terminals, 
of what use will that if there is no aperture to deliver the cargo? We have failure of infrastructure. We have, we don't know how to plan. For ports built in the 80s, there is no deliberateness. That's why the roads are there. There is no rail. And we expect, despite our growth of population, to now 206 million, to be using the same infrastructure we are using in the 90s. There is no rail. And what gladdens my heart is now, the government has woken up to see the maritime industry. There is rail to be connected to Apapa and uh, I think Kampot, and every port in Nigeria. Our salvation lies in application of appropriate technology. If there is 100% cargo examination in Nigeria, it takes five hours to examine a cargo, a, a 20 feet container unit, when you are doing it manually. Five hours, because every item has to be examined. But if we have scanners, how long will it take? Five minutes. So gentlemen, you could see technology is that light, is that illumination that you will shine and have the rats and the cockroaches, you know, running away because they don't want to see the light. And so it is important that at every aspect, there is that technology. I think it's getting together. When the Nigerian Shippers Council carried out a, stu a study with the operators, that is the shipping companies, the terminal operators, were able to see development and an attempt, you know, for uh, digitalization of our ports. Some are very high. In fact, one port scored about uh, 70, you know, but there are others with 20. And we said for the first quarter, we are assessing. We've gone around even last week to see how far they are adopting technology. Now, but again, one thing, it's not only for them to adopt their technology. There must be, you know, others because it takes two to tango and you cannot club with one. Others, you know, banks, they are there because banks are working with the terminals. You know, we have the shippers themselves. We have the freight forwarders. We have uh, the uh, Steve Doris almost come together, have integrated system so that we cut down the delays we cut down the inefficiency, we become transparent. At that same time, it's a detergent. Technology is a detergent that will wipe away all the grease and the dirt and the opaqueness that we have in our system. It is important we always come to the law. Law has provided soccer for trade, for investment. And Nigeria Maritime Law Association must, out of necessity, come out and look at what is happening. After all, didn't they say that shipping is international? There is no regime except for uh, maybe the common law of uh, uh, the common law principle that guides the carriage of goods within Nigeria. And it is weak. Um, if one carries cargo from say X from Potako to Meduguri, and there's accident, all the earth got broken. It is, they will say, oh, sorry, God, is God that caused. But that's not true. There must be some, there must be a contract between the owner of the cargo and the transporter. There must be responsibilities, obligations, and the consequences. And that's what we have been bogged with by investors. How do you, they want, we are talking about the Rotterdam rules, Maritime Plus Convention, but, how will you issue a through bill of lading if you don't know what regulates the inland transportation? It's a venture that nobody will, do, will, will dare to do because there is uh, no specific. And I'm happy that, and we are bringing it to Nigeria Maritime Law Association, a bill will carry of goods by land act to make this thing straight. So this is one aspect. But uh, over the years, I think it is important to uh, emphasize on technology, you will not be doing uh, turnaround time for the ports, increased cargo throughput, port operations, governance of cargo clearance, will go through reduction of tariffs and also remove the, uh, the, the, the leakages. Uh, again, Nigerian custom service, uh, way of the advanced cargo information system, 
which uh, people call the cargo, uh, advanced cargo. Now, this, more than any transport document, including the Bill of Lading, will speak about sending manifest of cargo coming to Nigeria well in advance, even before the ship sells. It's the obligation of the shipper to bring that information. And the information is containing the value, the volume, the, the cost, the weight, and all other issues. Because most cargo that come to Nigeria are underdeclared, or there is concealment. Nigerian shippers are not the best of uh, 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 people who declare the true value you know, of cargo. If we have cargo advanced or advanced cargo information system, that technology, there is no hiding place. One cannot under declare cargo. And what will that mean? It means boost in the uh, revenue of government in the custom. It means the MPA will have more revenue. The master will have more revenue. It's only the poor shippers council that will not have revenue. But it is important we start slowly looking at these things and have maybe a kind of national awareness committee to first of all, understand what the world is going. I have said it again, protectionism, we have to take part in our trade. We are no more ashamed of the word protectionism because those who sent the word protectionism, they are the masters of protectionism. We can never be ashamed to do that. So the cabotage uh, ought to have something. Uh, we ought to own and control the transport sector also. That is consciousness of creating a cluster and also automation. I've now seen how they come together because for you to be conscious, for you to have efficiency, a clean system, you must out of necessity be conscious of your domain first and what it can do to this country, what it can do to this country. I am also incidentally the chairman of National Fleet Implementation Committee. And uh, we have seen there are critical gaps in, in infrastructure, uh, in the ship industry, uh, ship building and ship repair yet, where we have to tow our vessels, you know, to Senegal or Namibia, you know, instead of uh, uh, here, uh, so associated industries, involvement of our banks, involvement of our insurance companies. All these are part of the clusters. And we would like that to be a geographically determined place and time and promoted to the extent that one day we'll say we have a cluster that is driven by technology and modern issues. We are building or promoting the building of, uh, uh, of the uh, dry pots to bring shipping to the nation. And this must out of, they must be modern ports. What I'm saying is Nigerian Maritime Law Association ought to have studied what is happening at Lake. You know, so that they will know that we are not going to repeat the mistake of a papa. There is nothing closed. These decisions must be open. And lawyers are very prominent. They will advise you because of past experience, records, and so on, this is what ought to be done so that we don't make that mistake. We ought to be operating an open society as far as infrastructure is concerned. And then there is a concession agreement. Not many of you know about this concession agreement. We are not saying everybody should be a party, but out of uh, uh, contribution and the importance of stakeholders, they must have you know, input. A concession agreement will tr could truncate so many things. So it's not just you talking to yourself. This has to be open to you. And uh, I'm happy that uh, these discussions by Nigerian Maritime Law Association, I told you, if you invite party, please go. If they don't invite you, please get crashed. You have a very, very important role to play. If we had our fleet, we know we have. 5.4 billion expected to be added to the GDP. We have 1.63 billion Naira as in tax. We are paying about $97 billion to foreign ship owners in terms of freight. And I've given example, if all the taxi drivers in Lagos are Indians. So how will that reflect today? If every taxi driver you give, the Indians will carry the money and go to their countries. And that's what's happening. 
how can 17 uh, 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 97 uh, billion dollars can you imagine what effect it will have on employment on infrastructure so we have to be conscious that's the first thing we don't just say clusters no no clusters mean something and we have to define them in the interest but then we need to have rules and regulations you know and laws we have to change certain laws fob courage will not do anything to us all the opec countries don't have fob courage why is it nigeria only that we invite people to come and carry our crude you know is this because of the risk some say we may be arrested because nigeria is owing is in uh, arbitration cases and so on but the oil is drying anyway so let us try it if the oil is not drying, we are having alternative uh, source of energy. Let's try it. Let them, at least for try and say, let us tell our children that we also carry our petroleum product. You know, it is important. Don't look at maritime as something romantic. Maritime is more than that. We have been known. We should study this, bring out its effects, connectivity of the port. You bring a cargo to Calabar. How do you carry it to Thailand? Nobody cares. Where are the roads? Where are the, are the rail? So it has to be conscious. I'm coming back to this uh, word again. Consciousness. That is very, very important. It's only when we tap that deliberately, bring about all these things, then we can start to have these meaningful clusters. And if it means working internationally with the government, regulations, but the lawyers must be at the forefront of this. I thank you very much. Asan Bailey was appointed as Executive Secretary and the CEO of the Nigerian Shippers Council in June 2013 for a four-year tenure, which was extended by the President in 2017. So Mr. Asan Bailey is not acting, he is a de facto Executive Secretary and the CEO of the Nigerian Shippers Council. And I must say, sir, that um, listening to your keynote address, I mean, I could see the vigor and the passion with which you spoke. And I was wondering, you said you were just going to talk from Jotins. So I'm like, what if you had prepared a speech? You couldn't have done more than this. So grateful to you, sir. And I know you kept referring to being deliberate, being deliberate, being conscious. And I must agree with you that as lawyers, like you said, we need to get crashed. Even if we're not invited, we go in and do our best to make sure that the laws that we have in Nigeria are up to date and at par with what obtains in the, um, in the world. I mean, align with global best practices so that we are in tune with current trends and we're not left behind. I know you're passionate about the single um, window I know that because I've read some of your you know, speeches and all of that, comparing Nigeria with Lome and like, why can't we do better than Lome? So I, on behalf of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, I want to say a big thank you to you, sir, for the keynote address. It's so insightful and we really, really have had a wonderful time. Thank you very much, Mr. Asan Bailey. My pleasure, please. My pleasure. Following the keynote address, we will now break up into the panel of, um, of sessions. We have our panelists who are ready, and I'm sure they're gearing up to go. But um, before we do that, I think we're going to have a kind of a, an interlude, just a mini break, like, um, like a short break. I think we're having like a five minute break, if I'm right, if I'm correct. Hello, everyone. You're welcome back. I'm sure we all needed that um, break. I know how virtual meetings can be, but we're back. May I remind us all to kindly mute our phones, please? Thank you.
We will now be going into the session with our knowledgeable and erudite panelists who will discuss the theme of um, this annual lecture, which is a role of automation in the development of the Nigerian shipping cluster. I'm really looking forward and I'm, I mean, I'm sure you would all agree with me that the Executive Secretary of the Shippers Council has set the ball rolling, rolling. That was a fairy delivery. And um, you know, I'm so excited and I'm sure there will be so much more to gain from our panelists. The moderator for this session will be Doing Yafu, and I'll now hand over to Doing. Doing is a product of the prestigious King's College, Lagos. He holds a Bachelor of Laws from Nigeria's premier university, University of Ibadan, a Master of Laws from Swansea University, Wales, and he's duly qualified to practice in Nigeria and England and Wales. He's a partner at Bloomfield Law Practice, a leading commercial and dispute resolution law firm in Nigeria. His core areas of practice are corporate finance, banking and securities, transportation, international trade, foreign investments and divestments, insurance, project finance, energy, etc. Ade Doyi is a member of several professional bodies and he sits on the board of several companies. Doyi, over to you. Thank you very much, Eik. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be listening to us. Um, we're happy to have you. Um, I'm sure after the very insightful um, and conversation by the Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Marine and Shippers Council. We should be looking forward to the panel session. The panel is on the panel today. We have three very seasoned practitioners who will be touching, who will be addressing three different topics. Um, the first is Mr. Dera Nadi, who is the Deputy Controller of the Nigerian Customs Service. He will be talking about single window automation and cargo clearance in Nigeria. I think that is very timely after the kind of speech of the executive secretary. The next paper will be from Mrs. Nick Albiayon. She's the registrar of ships from within the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency. And the last but not least is Mrs. Adeban Akibobwe, who is the legal counsel for Bolori Transportation and Logistics, Nigeria Limited. She'll be speaking on the legal issues around automation of shipping operations in Nigeria. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Anandi to please present um, his paper titled Ship Single Window Automation and Cargo Clearance in Nigeria. Mr. Anandi, please, you have the floor. Dara Anandi is Deputy Controller Admin Ogun 1, Command Diroko. He is the immediate past DC enforcement of the TCIP, a former member of the National Trade Facilitation Committee, former PRO Zone A. Nigerian Customs Service, also the PRO at Papa Command during the Port Reform and Concession, WCO Award winner for promotion of customs business relations. Mr. Nandi, it's a pleasure to have you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are glad to be part of this. And uh, I want to bring good greetings from the Controller General of Customs, Colonel Hamid Ibrahim Lee. And I also want to skip the protocols because I understand we have just 15 minutes to have the discussion with you. And uh, I'm also happy that uh, we have been given this opportunity to talk about automation in Nigerian Customs Service and uh, about the single window. It's also coming on the heels of the fact that the uh, federal government has just approved 3.1 billion US dollars for the automation of Nigerian Customs Service uh, in a 20-year uh, modernization program. So it is important that uh, we review what we have been doing in the past and then uh, use the opportunity to establish what is current and then we talk about- Sorry, we can't hear you very clearly, sir. Sorry to interject, sir. Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, it's better now, sir. Thank you, sir. It's better. Okay, I was saying that it is important that we are invited to this uh, program. We are grateful for that because it's coming on the heels of a uh, Nigerian Customs Service uh, being positioned uh, to 
be modernized following the 3.1 billion US dollars contract just signed by the federal government for 20 year old, a 20 years modernization program at the service. Let me start by saying that the import and export and the transit trade has to deal with multiple stakeholders has been exposed by uh, one of the speakers here, Dr. Hassan Bello. And, uh, but I also want to say that the, even though the multi, uh, there are multiple stakeholders in the system, two things are common to both of them. Uh, we have profit maximization, and we also have uh, issues of security. And here we are talking about two main bodies. We are talking about government uh, as a regulator, and we're also talking about uh, business. Uh, and both of them share the same interest. Government wants to make revenue from the port environment and from business. Business also want to maximize their profit. Both of them also want to protect their environment. Business wants to protect their business. So they talk about security too. At the same time, government also wants to protect national interest. So it's also about security. Let me say that uh, export and uh, all the other activities is just about these two things. Particularly for the developing economy, where the emphasis is mostly on revenue collection. Then we talk about national security. Though in other climes, the emphasis is mainly on maybe national security because they collect their revenue from excise duties that, that is internal. So for us, what are those things that cause problem when it comes to cargo clearance. It is the fact that uh, business transactions increase every day, cargo throughput increase every day, population is growing every day, and because that is happening, uh, there are interests that must clash. For government, the challenge becomes, how do you balance trade facilitation and national security by regulating trade? And then for business too, how do you maximize profit without running foul of what the law states. So that underscores the challenge faced by both government and business in facilitating trade. And let me explain this with statistics. For a uh, statistic that is backed by United Nations uh, Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business, for a single transaction, there are 30 parties that use 40 documents. 30 parties using 40 documents. There are 200 documents for a single trade transaction. 70% of Hello, Mr. Nadi, we've lost your audio, sir. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, that's fine, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. I, I was saying that one of the conflicts that we have that faces both government and this is how to maximize facilitation of their own personal interest, both business and government. And we said that as cargo throughput is increasing, the challenge of government trying to facilitate trade without compromising security becomes an issue. At the same time, the challenge of business trying to make profit without running foul of the government process is also an issue. So what do we do? We must create an avenue to balance the two. And one is such avenue is what I just discussed about the main challenge. Globally, it is said that for a single transaction in business, you need 30 parties that use 40 documents. 200 documents for a single trade transaction, 70% of these documents are said to be reuse, reused at least. Then 15% of them are reused 30 times. That shows you the volume of infractions and barriers affect trade. And this is where trade facilitation comes into place. What is trade facilitation? It is removal of all barriers that are inimical to trade. And one of the tools, one of the major tools for trade protection is automation. And when you talk about automation, our mind normally goes to single window. 
please let me at this juncture state that single window is not strictly about automation. If automation comes into play in single window, it is very important, it is desirable, but that's not the main thing. What we are trying to talk about here is creating an atmosphere of transparency and accountability, creating an atmosphere of standardization and simplification of documents, and also trying to partner with business, that is regulators trying to partner with business and trade. Almost all the stakeholders here try to do, which is also what Dr. Hassan Bello is inviting Nigeria Maritime Association to come in because you are also business. We are also inviting you to partner with us as government. Now, having said that, we have to dwell now on automation and ICT development. So, we said that the most adoptable form of participation for trade remains to integrity. We've already made allusion to that. I had Dr. Bello talk about use of scanners. If we bring the best scanners in the world and our declaration still remains fraud, fraudulent, the scanners can help. As a matter of fact, the scanners will even translate into double examination of that cargo. Because when you scan that container that is fraudulently declared and you find infractions, you are still going to present it for physical examination. So while we are trying to discuss the issue of automation here, let us from day one, from inception, capture it that it is important that we also address the issue of integrity of the entire supply chain. It is very, very important that we do that. Now, for the world organizations, uh, global organizations like WCO, World Customer Organization, and the WTO, any facility which allows parties involved in trade and transport to lodge standardized information and documents with a single entry point to fulfill all important export transacted, uh, transit regulated environment is a single window. So we are not talking here about just computers, about machinery, about the equipment. It can just be an office. But what we are saying is that because of the volume and complexity of international trade, we may go beyond physical to now bring in automation. And this is very important. Now, in Nigeria, where are we right now? The Nigerian Customs Service is in a position to lead the Petro National Single Window Project, which is not yet up to 70%. We have tried so much, considering what we are doing before the 2006 reforms. So much has been achieved in the system. But we are not saying that it is yet Uhuru, because I'm going to discuss that a few minutes now. Now, for us, there's consensus issue of a single window deployment globe but it remains the notion of submission of data by parties involved in important transactions to one point that will be readily accessible. That is the key word, readily accessible to all concerned. And like we said before, what are we supposed to do? Single window concept is instrument of trade desired in the national agenda, which we've always been doing. I hope I'm still audible because my internet is telling me that it's, it's uh, discussing. Yes, sir, but if you don't mind, if you can speak louder so just everybody can catch up, be appreciated, sir. Thank you. Sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All stakeholders in Nigeria currently agree that there is need to adopt cost effective business practices that can secure timely, efficient, and effective procedures. And we have been doing this since 1998. Permit me to quickly run through how we started the process. We started in 1998 by adopting the ECOWAS as CUDA program, the 2.7. We ran it through 2005 to 2008 and moved on to it. Then in 2008, 2006 to 2009, something very significant happened in the port industry. Bring the port concessioning, created alongside the port concessioning to e-payment and e-declaration, e, e manifest This is very important. And in 2009 to 2012, we gave the privilege of stakeholders in the industry making declarations from their private offices. This is very significant. If you were in Nigeria and you are participating in port trading, when we are using bill of entry, when you have to go into the customs, 
to capture data manually. You have to queue up to do that. When we had the famous, or rather infamous long room, all that now has been things of the past. The same 2006, 2008, they introduced the non-intrusive cargo uh, examination, the scanners, into our uh, port system. Though they are not very optimal now, but there are significant developments that removed us from what it used to be. And we still look forward to that uh, happening once again with the uh, current automation that is about to start uh, that will last for uh, 20 years. Then we also talked about the establishment of the ICT infrastructure and capacity building, uh, including training of not just our own personnel, but also uh, stakeholders in the industry. At a time, one of the conditions for renewing your license as a freight forwarder was that you will attend a customs capacity building program before your license can be uh, renewed. We have achieved that. But presently, if you recall, in 2004, a set target of 48 hours clearance was set for the nation. But we have since moved beyond that. The present set target is 24 hours. But I tell you, there are some companies that make some clearance that make genuine, honest, and compliant declarations that take their cargo out of the port in six hours. Sadly, those that don't make honest declarations lower our annual average. So it now appears that we are not making progress. The truth is that we are making progress. There are some compliant traders that take their cargo out of the port in six hours, bearing other infrastructural deficiencies like road and lack of uh, trucks and other logistic programs. But in terms of real-time cargo clearance out of the custom system, some people are already achieving six hours. However, if you compare with national average where there are other delays, the value comes down to what uh, Dr. Hassan mentioned to a dwell time of 21 days and so on, sad as it is. And that is part of what we believe that we are going to also improve upon. Now, the adoption of a single window platform to which both parties can relate transparently, we promote mutual trust and understanding, thus reducing both. So what we are going to do, what are those things that we make stakeholders not to do the right thing. Sometimes it has to do with policy. Government issues certain policies that stakeholders think that they were not properly consulted and therefore resistance comes into play. Or they think it's almost impossible. Or some business contract has already been signed prior to that contract being issued. Again, that takes us to what Dr. Hassan said about advanced information and advanced ruling. So these are things that I imagine that we as a nation need to improve upon if we must get our record straight. And it's good that coming into public discussions like this. Now, again, let us talk about what are those things that we have to discuss here that we bring mutual trust. There are relationships that exist between government and government agencies. I attend meetings in Shippers Council. I attend meetings at MPA. We have NAVDAC, we have SON, we have NDLA, NESRA. This NCC, Nigerian Corporate Commission, these are government agencies that relate with us. We have business to business. There are businessmen banks that go to do business with stakeholders like clearing agents and so on and so forth, do business with shipping, shipping lines, terminal operators. We also have government to business which is what I do with these stakeholders. And then we have other uh, uh, issues like this, like banks, uh, documentation by traders of interest, developing documents. All these are supposed to be automated, and we've done that. How did we achieve the automation? Let me list some of the technical issues in customs. All our ICT activities are currently managed through what we call the Nigerian Integrated Custom Information System too. With this system, we have migrated beyond ASCUDA++. Plus Plus. It is with this, you can, we are partnering with Wayfontaine, our technical partners. We can make your declarations. You can make pay in the bank. You can get to see how much you've paid. We, you, you can see how much you've paid from our own office. 
you can book for your declaration with terminal operators. And let me mention something significant here again, which I want this esteemed audience to capture. The only thing that custom does within the entire supply chain right now that they do physically and they participate actively while interfacing with the stakeholders is cargo examination. Just cargo examination. If you go to the bank to perform you their place, if you submit your documents for issuance of par to your bank, we don't follow you to do that. Do that. Your bank does not even come to us. They upload those documents to us electronically. If you make requests to terminal operators to drop your terminal for examination, we don't join you there. When making delivery of your cargo with their exit is achieved themselves. The major thing we do is just that examination. And hopefully, by the time we finish the full automation and we get involved with uh, non-intrusive cargo examination, which is scanning, and declarations are, uh, have high integrity, that too we reduce to the extent that we will not go fully electronic. Now, let me mention that in doing all this, we have now so much hope for the e-custom and the future that it will bring. What is the beauty of the e-custom? It will encompass every other thing, including enforcement aspect of customs operation, including administration, including daily operations of that, including also excise regime in customs. Yes, it is going to take 20 years, but they say a journey of 1,000 miles starts with a step. We are seriously looking forward to that. That will also include licensing activities. So for us to license you, everything will be online. Information sharing will be on everything that we are going to do is now going to be online. And what is going to be the objective? Let me, uh, permit me to read it out because they are very important. Number one, to provide an NICT platform to digitalize customs business process and procedures. Upgrade ICT infrastructure and address critical operational challenges and loopholes using the new technologies, including big data, artificial intelligence. Look at that, artificial intelligence. I'm so excited and I look forward to this so much. To enhance ICT system and fasten custom information process. The establishment of e-custom system will replace Nigerian customs legacy system by ensuring the entire custom process will be run on a digitalized platform and each step is recorded, transparent and traceable. So the issue of arguments will no longer be there. It will be about world best practices. So you will have issue of litigation. You have something that you can rely on as proof to say that this is how this is. Now, there will be seamless improvement. Hello? So now let me state that what role do we expect from stakeholders like you? Dr. Hassan made reference to you barging in into the system. You don't need to barge in. There are interprets. They are already there. Our legal system, uh, the custom, uh, SS, uh, uh, custom and SI Management Act, is being reviewed. And that review. Hello? Hello? We can hear you, sir. OK. OK. Our, our, legal, our uh, legal provision is being re reviewed. An advocate and request that National Assembly should pass that, that law because it's still the new one. That new one is going to accommodate some of the things we are discussing here, the ICT infrastructure which hitherto were not captured because as at the time the law was written in 1955, reviewed in 2004, there were no provisions for ICT infrastructure so much. So now that we have them uh, and it has become the law, the, the law needs to accommodate them too. The issue of advanced ruling, which Dr. Uh, Hassan mentioned before, that if you approach customs, to request that I want to import this particular item. What do I pay as duty for it when it lands Nigeria? And custom gives you a written approval to import. They have no right to change it again when that cargo arrives because they've already committed themselves. But we also need to back this by the law. These are new things that the law needs to do. 
So what, what do we really need to achieve seamless automation and ICT infrastructure? We need political will of government, which we have already achieved through the three points. So you have about um, three minutes left, sir. No problem. So we've achieved political will because government has already approved 3.1 billion US dollars, which is what we've been praying for. We also need a strong uh, a lead agency, a role that customs is already uh, uh, playing as a lead agency for automation of the port industry. And we also need partnership between government and business. What we need here is integrity of the business community to be improved. And we bet, however, we are supposed to explain government that policies should be favorable to address concerns raised by the business community. Finally, we also need the use of international standards or whatever we are doing. That is very important. Nigeria cannot continue to play locally. Yes, we are the end of Africa. Yes, our GDP is good. But when it comes to international business, we should learn to play by the rules. What are we asking for? Total compliance. Total compliance to WCO uh, Kyoto Convention, which is uh, the convention that is actually devoted to facility. Total compliance to our declaration of World Consumption, which is the convention, uh, the declaration that is devoted to integrity of the entire supply chain. We've what lost your audio again, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. OK. So having said this, I don't need to uh, repeat the benefits inherent if we achieve all this. We'll have speedy clearance as is expected. We'll have harmonized operation. We'll have reduced cost, which is what every developing economy needs, reduced cost in terms of trade. And we also have increased profit for all. And most important, we'll have overall national security. I wish to once again, on behalf of the Controller General, uh, thank the organizers for inviting customs to participate in this year's uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anadi, for your presentation. Um, I would, I was able to gather, like a lot of us here, that you were able to give us a brief introduction as to where the customs is as of today. The recent of the system, you were able to educate us on what single window was and stress that single window is not only just automation, but a part of it, and it will aid. What single window essentially is to provide standardization and uniformity among stakeholders. You also mentioned that um, the scanners are useful, but then it's also when you have issues of um, infringing importers, you have to have double inspection. Uh, and you also talked about the fact that Compliant traders are getting their cargo out of the port within six hours, and that issue with delay, apart from the infrastructure surrounding the port, is relation to non-compliant importers and delaying documentation or non-declaration. Um, and you also talked about the need to have standardization of international best practices. We can be part of the community of nations and not apply with same. I think all in all, um, you're able to tell us that customs is willing to do what is needed. Um, but it appears there seems to be a lack of um, communication with what is expected from you and the shippers. But that said, before moving on, I just had one clarification I wanted to get. Is in where would you say you are at the level of automation today? Where you want to be in percentages? Just before we move on to the next speaker. Okay. Uh, if you place us uh, on a scale of 10 today, I would say that Nigerian Customs Service is at six. I must admit that. However, relative to where we are coming from, it is a tremendous leap. It is a tremendous leap. Like I said, you don't need to go to customs now to pay your duty. Recall that there was a payment of duty was physical. You go to customs to pay the duty cash. Officers will collect the money cash and issue you receipt. We migrated that to when you go to the bank and pay bring your receipt to customs, and then wait for the bank to bring a, a box. Through all that. But now, where bank, when the situation now, where you can stay, 
pay in your house or in your office. And even the bank and customs will acknowledge receipt of that payment. Even CBN will, will acknowledge receipt. In fact, before, after payment, you wait for two, three, four days for CBN to acknowledge that they have received it this morning. So we migrated from payment in custom premises with your cash. We got to a state where you go to pay in the bank and bring receipt, and bank will have to bring their own receipt for us to reconcile the two. Then we post up for CBN to say yes. We account. Then migrated from all that. Now from your phone, you can pay customs duty. Custom will see it. If you are importer, we see it. CBN will see it. The bank will see it. We have also gone to a level where you do e manifest. Remember in the past, if you bring 2,000 containers on a particular manifest, somebody will have to do what we call data capture. Imagine capturing all the details on the plating for one container inside a computer. For now, you can give us that manifest electronically. And before then, give us manifest like two weeks ahead. We collect it, it, them, that manifest will come, you put the copy volumes. Now you send the manifest to capture it. The school copy is kept there for legal purposes because that should be there. So it's actually a great improvement. We've achieved so much. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, I will allow, um, I'm sure we have other people who have questions in the course of the, at the end of all the presentations. Um, at this point in time, I would like to invite our second panelist, in the person of Mr. Seneca Obiayo, who is the Registrar of Ships. Uh, Ms. Obiayo was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1993. She had a stint in litigation and corporate practice before joining the Nigerian Maritime Authority in 1999 as a senior legal officer. After working in various capacities in the legal services department, she was deployed to the Reform Coordination and Strategic Management Unit in 2017 as an assistant director. She contributed immensely to several reforms in the MASA. In July 2018, NECA was deployed to Nigerian Ship Registration Office as acting registrar of ships. She became a deputy director and substantive registrar of ships in 2020. Nika is an executive member of Nigeria Maritime Law Station. She's one of our ex schools and uh, she's also a member of the International Bar Association and Nigerian Bar. She has fellowship from Chapter Institute of Arbitrators UK and Nigeria Institute of Shipping. Uh, on several locations, she served as a resource person at shipping and maritime events, both locally and internationally. Nika is a committed public servant who strives for excellence and is passionate about the development of the maritime sector. Ms. Obiano, it's a pleasure to have you. The floor is all yours. I'm very sorry. Good afternoon. Well, well it's almost noon. Good day, uh, distinguished participants, and thank you, Doni, for the introduction. Let me first start by um, expressing my Director General's um, gratitude, Dr. Jamo, when he received the invitation to speak at this event, even though he had asked that I represent the agency. So he appears that I wear two caps speaking on his behalf and as a registrar of ships. So I believe that if anything goes wrong, I should be held responsible as the registrar of ships and not the director general. My topic this afternoon is imperative of automation of the Nigerian ship registry and fleet development. However, considering the technicalities of ship registration, I have chosen to rather start by giving an overview of the Nigerian ship registration to enable our esteemed delegates understand why automation is key to the development of our ship registry and fleet expansion. Um, sorry about this. 
So we have the content which has the overview um, about of the ship registration processes, then shipping development and fleet expansion. Then we talk about imperative of automation, our journey so far, and then I conclude. Taking an overview of Nigerian ship registration, well, we all understand that registration is required under international law for any flag that is flying, flying a country's flag. And that gives um, ownership and genuine link to a vessel registered under the flag. However, there is no binding international framework to regulate registration processes. But in Nigeria, we have the legal framework for, for ship registration, which is covered by the Merchant Shipping Act, parts two and three, and the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency Act under part eight, the Coastal and Inland Shipping Act and the Coastal and Inland Shipping Bareboat Regulation, as well as the implementation guidelines. Why I said it's important for us to understand the ship registration processes so that we know what our challenges are and why it is imperative for us to have an automated ship registry. Under section 17 of the Merchant Shipping Act, we are obliged to keep a number of registers, register of merchant ships, fishing vessels, bare boat vessels, and licensed ships below 15 gross tonnage. We are also obligated under the Coastal and Inland Shipping Act to maintain special registers for cabotage for wholly owned bare boats, joint venture, foreign and exempted vessels. All these have different registration requirements. The ship registry also runs ancillary services, such as registration of mortgages, rotation of mortgages, grant of consent to sell, issuance of bill of sale, deleting vessels that have been registered and want to go to another flag. So Limasa, of course, as a safety administration has flag state responsibilities over the flags flying the Nigerian flag. So these are the steps that we usually take in registration process. Unlike what happens in most climbs, a ship registry has its own peculiarity in the sense that it's not a one-stop shop. We have the survey department um, located under the Maritime Safety and Seafarer Standards Department. And then we have a different department taking care of the seafarers. So when you talk about ship registration, it just rotates around um, some departments because in the first place, the vessels have to be surveyed before the survey report is forwarded to the ship registry. So that's why I have stated that we have the pre-registration requirements but before you register any vessel on that flag, you will definitely have to do a name reservation. Then we have the registration requirements, ownership and eligibility status, and all the documentations that you need to provide before you can flag a Nigerian vessel. Then we have to seek authorization before we finally register the vessel and issue a flag certificate. So our requirements you can find on the website. You can also find in our tariff booklets as well. So persons who are qualified to own a registered Nigerian ship, they're Nigerian citizens under the Merchant Shipping Act, bodies, corporates, and partnerships established under Nigerian law. So that brings me to where we are actually looking at, which is the data in the Nigerian ship registry. So here you can see that we have a data of Nigerian registered vessels from 2016 to 2020, showing the tonnages and the number of vessels that we have, 4 point something million gross tonnage and 2,584 active vessels, which is actually nothing for a nation like ours. So that's the registered tonnage and the registered flag of vessels. So shipping development and fleet expansion. According to the review carried out by UNCTAD in 2020, the global commercial shipping fleet in 2019 grew by 4.1%, representing the highest rise since 2014. 
gas carriers experienced the fastest growth, followed by oil tanker, bulk carriers, and container ships. So where are we in all of this? In 2018, we're only able to pose 1.5 million tonnage, ranking 43rd in the world. And in 2019, we had about 1.6 million tonnage, ranking 48. That's our contribution towards merchant fleet, which is really very insignificant. Um, the chart that we have here shows that Africa has less than 1%, makes less than 1% contribution to global fleet trade. So it's something really that we're worried about, even though we would say that in Africa, maintaining a, a closed registry, we have probably the largest registry in Africa after Liberia, which operates an open registry, but even at that, it's um, really very insignificant. So driving Nigerian's fleet development, which Nimasa is charged with the responsibility of doing, and the Honorable Minister of Transport recognized that there was need to diversify the economy and address the imbalance of trade in the industry. Then you know, he inaugurated the Nigerian Fleet Implementation Committee, which Mr. Hassan Bello is the chair. And they have been doing quite a lot. The committee um, is presently at the critical stage of the implementation process, which is actually capital injection for fleet acquisition. So for us, for people to want to flag Nigerian vessel, they would want to see a registry of integrity and a responsive registry that is at speed with what it does. So our quest to build a flag, a quality flag that will attract investors and grow tonnage capacity led to a committee that was set up in 2018. The committee carried out comparative studies of notable registries globally to understand how best we can run our practices. So recommendations were made and grouped under short, medium, and long-term measures, which we have developed into the roadmap for reform of the ship registry. This was done in February, unfortunately, shortly after we had the sad COVID pandemic. So this is our 12 reform initiatives for modernizing the ship registry. It has beside it the E-flag, the need for a digitalized register of ships and data management. So for us, um, digitalization is key. And um, that is why we have taken out the essentials in this reform initiatives. Looking at the E-flag, we looked at the reform initiatives we need to carry out in this regard. Automation of the ship registry, paramount to us, creating and enabling electronic submission of documents. And eventually, we may have to go by the way of electronic certification, which has been recognized by the IMO, and some countries are working towards that. So the expected outcome for us is quicker and quality registration process, access to e-platform for vessel registration, a streamlined ship registration process. Then also looking at the digitalized register of ship. The reform thing for us here is to create and maintain electronic register in line with the Merchant Shipping Act so that at the press of the button, it will be very easy for us to determine the vessels that we have on our register, the ownership status of the vessels, and when something is going wrong. So the expected outcome is that we're going to have a comprehensive and verifiable data of Nigerian registered vessels and eventually have effective, ensure effective data management. We're also looking at flag promotion and protection and we would hope to drive awareness and compliance on implemented reform processes, such as rebranding and promotional campaigns to up the scale for our ship registry, which will increase flag visibility and enhance customer stake relations. But at the core of all of this, especially automation, is human capacity development. Um, the, reform, the, the committee that looked at reforming the ship registry also saw that there was need to improve the technical capacity of the ship registry staff. We have actually begun a peer review and exchange program. We, some of our registry staff were in Malta in February of this year. We have also spoken to the present Norwegian 
ambassador when he visited the director Duran Nemasa if we can schedule an exchange program in 2021 COVID permitting. This, of course, will enable us to have highly experienced and technical chief registry officers and surveyors who will be able to, ex um, to show professionalism and competency in the discharge of their responsibilities. So like I said, the epicenter of our reform initiative is digitalization. A digital transformation will no doubt accelerate our process and service delivery capacity. We are well aware that ship registrations can be challenging and require significant administration effort. And that was why I took us to the, the requirements for flag registration. But if we adopt a modern and flexible enterprise solution, we'll be able to address some of these challenges. In doing that, we are currently working with our ICT units to engage a, a service provider. We had we had, we had one last year and um, he, was, he had actually promised to deliver the software. Tomorrow we have a meeting with him to understand the kind of ERP that he's hoping to deploy. But what we have been able to do in the meantime is just invoicing functionality using the Sage ERP X3 solution, which is an agency-wide platform. Our ultimate goal is to have a centralized one-stop platform that will cater for ship registry survey and seafarers activities. Like I explained, we have the survey differently, we have the seafarers portal differently, but in most clients, all of this is found on that one-stop platform. So it makes it easy for you to know the seafarers that are engaged on the vessels, for you to know if the vessels are, are in compliance with international conventions such as SOLAS, and even for the surveyors to be able to walk offline and impute their reports online and we would have a seamless relationship and we're able to also maintain a wide range of information on vessel ownership and mortgages. So for us, again, in 2020, it became very clear that digitalization was a key differentiator due to COVID-19 pandemic. That actually, the ship registry staff became essential workers this year because we were not automated and we needed to be in the office all the time to ensure that our stakeholders needs were met. So if we had a digitalized and automated ship registry, it would have been easy for us to work from home like is done in other clients. So um, of course the imperative of automation would be for us to build investors and stakeholders confidence because when people are, well, when they are confident of your processes, obviously they would want to come to you. We, we are aware that a number of Nigerians have their vessels outside of this show. And our aim is that once our processes are automated and things begin to work as is being done in other clients, the investors will come in and help us see how we can grow our, our tonnage and make Nigerians more visible in international maritime trade. Of course, automation will help us simplify our registration process, improve decision-making, and increase our audit efficiencies. So in all of this, while not folding our hands and waiting for COVID, we have begun the journey to see how we can get into automation. We had to carry out a comprehensive and verifiable data of our registered vessels. And I make bold to say that today you can get data on updated ship um, flag in our registry without a waste of a time. And we provide this data to the survey department. We provide this data also to IMO in particular, which is actually what they use to determine our contribution to to merchant fleet in 2018 and 2019, which wasn't the case initially. We, in February, we were able to provide, to produce new certificates of registry with security features. We had promised stakeholders that those certificates, we will start to use them this year. But unfortunately for us, all the certificates were not produced and then we had some setbacks, but we've been promised that 
the last delivery will come in January. So by Q1 of 2021, we hope that we would have a new and more secure certificate issued to uh, flagged vessels because a number of the times we have been challenged with manipulated certificates of registry, which has actually painted the registry in bad light. Sorry, Mr. Um, Gang, we have also, minutes. yes, sorry, okay. We have been able to reduce errors in our certificates largely by 95%. It's difficult to come in and say that we don't, you have, we have made a mistake in issuing you certificates. We now have a dedicated ship registry email, which makes it possible for us to interface urgently with our stakeholders. We interface with foreign ship registries, particularly to ensure that you don't use forged certificates to bring in vessels into Nigeria. We work with IMO, like I explained, and we're complying to IMO regulations on certification, and we have improved stakeholders' customer relations. And we also initiated certification process for ISO 9901, which is a quality assurance for us and will help us as we go into automation proper. Distinguished participants, the economic benefits of a world-class and automated ship registry are enormous and it will enhance the respect, integrity, and reputation of the nation's fleet, attract financing and investment opportunities. The number of vessels calling at Nigerian ports will increase more with automated ports, container parks, rail networks between terminal ports, haulage, and services in general provided to the maritime industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bion, for your presentation. Um, I believe we, we now have a thorough understanding of the, the practice of the ship registry. We also have a good understanding as to where you are today in your process to automating the registry. Um, you also let us um, understand or reminded us of what the benefits of automation can bring for the industry. I was happy to hear that you pointed out that with a good automated system, it will increase opportunity for deep development, particularly from the financial angle. I think it's very useful. Financiers want to be sure that their security is protected and their rights are also protected. Um, just like I asked Mr. Anadi, I will now ask uh, in relation to your reform process, um, on a scale of one to 10, where would you say you are? And what would you want stakeholders to do to aid you to, um, to achieve this objective? It's quite laudable, and uh, we're happy to see that the registry is automated. As a user of the registry, uh, I myself and my colleagues have noticed the efficiency level. We encourage you to do more uh, and to have a quick turnaround. But we also like to know what can we do to aid you in this process? Thank you very much, Joey. I... I am happy to say that we have um, established very strong bond with stakeholders and um, we are beginning to get their cooperation. What has happened before now is that some of them um, did not understand the importance of, of flag registration and they left this bit to people that they tagged their agents, not agents properly speaking. And these um, persons have caused a lot of embarrassment to the industry in terms of using um, forged um, documentations and um, certificates to try to register their vessel because they give the impression that it is difficult to assess the regulator, it's difficult to assess NIMASA and they can do it on your behalf. But today, stakeholders are beginning to realize that it is a ripoff and that they can directly reach us and get advice in their processes. So what I ask is their patience and cooperation it's, um, it's challenging both ways, having them wait to get their documentations and move on because of the nature of the business and also for us. But I believe that if we continue to work together, we would achieve more. They had also given an interest that they would be ready to back us in terms of automation should we begin to have challenges. And we have still left that window open. So we're mindful that when we automate, we're going to help and help increase services both ways. So I believe that they would always be with us. Thank you for your 
uh, presentation a quick response. I'm sure other uh, participants have seen some questions here, but I'll allow our last speaker, Mr. Kipobwe, to make representations and then we'll take questions and answers. The next speaker is no other person than Mrs. Adebanke Akipobwe. She's a group legal counsel for Bolore Transport and Logistics Nigeria Limited. She was speaking on legal issues around automation of shipping operations in Nigeria. Um, we've tried to bring it from first and foremost from the customs perspective, the regulatory aspect, then we'll have a practitioner speak to us about the issues that they've seen in this sector there at all. Mr. Kimbogoye, the floor is yours, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone, distinguished panelists, um, guest speakers. It's a privilege to be here today. I've been asked to talk about legal issues around automation of shipping operations in Nigeria. I'm um, very gratified that um, I listened to the keynote address because a lot of the issues, legal issues had already been raised by Malam Bello. But in any case, we will, uh, this is a topic for all lawyers. This is a forum of mostly lawyers, and I'm sure we'll tackle that together. So in talking about the legal issues, um, um, on automation of shipping industry. We will look at the application of automation to shipping industries. We will do a critic of it, and then we'll do an assessment, and then we'll prefer some solutions. Of course, I have question, questions and answers. I am coming from a logistics company with the shipping division. So you will find that I will stress on the latter leg of shipping operations, which is actually uh, the transportation and delivery. You are all privy to the menace we have um, on the Apapa axis, which is peeling down to Lagos Metropolis, um, Metropolis right now, and all the other speakers had mentioned it. So I will also highlight on that. So what is automation? I'm talking about processes now. So what is the automation of application? Uh, uh, what is the automation? What is the, auto, sorry, what is the legal implication surrounding automation of our shipping processes? That's the word, shipping processes. I say here in my own um, small definition that simply put, it is the application of advanced technology, integrated technological system into shipping operations that manages everything from port of loading through uh, the carriage up to the point of final delivery to the consignee. So that is the process and that is what we are going to review today. When you see um, automated ports like the ports of Shanghai, I actually did uh, uh, a Google search of one of the ports, I think it's the port of Shanghai. And it says that it is the largest container port worldwide, worldwide and it's very efficient. In 2019 alone, they handled 403 million tons. And you have heard the tons that we are handling in Nigeria. That is what automation does. Automation brings efficiency, capacity, transparency and profitability. That is where we need to go. And that is what I believe we are doing. We are going that way. The increasing use of automation in port operation and processes is indicative of a technological paradigm shift where we see human beings are lessened or their, their, their job and obligations are, 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 how do I say, they're enhanced by technology. So where are we in Nigeria? How fully automated are we in Nigeria? This is the question today. I'm very happy that I listened to Mr. Dera. Mr. Dera, thank you very much. And I know that we have all moved. When I mean we have all moved, I'm coming from a port operation and a port agency background. I've seen NPA, they've automized their process, digitalized some processes. I've just listened to Nimasa and all of this and all of this, and we are scoring ourselves and we are saying, okay, 6%, 7%, but I must commend really the Nigerian customs, uh, Nigerian customs. In preparing for this paper, I actually did an investigation and find out that really from our operations, they said they had interest, which Mr. Dera Nandi confirmed, that they have this process, the nicest uh, computer system, and everything can be done by, by clearing agent from the comfort of their offices when they comfort. So, sir, you said 6%. I'll give six, six, six over 10. I'll give you nine over 10. I'll give you nine over 10. Customs, we thank you for what you're doing. Let's just look at what, what happened before um, automation. I call those days the dark ages, and that was when I joined shipping. Those were the days when you have an avalanche of claims. 
those are the days of sheep arrest. I'm always unhappy to go to work on a Friday because I don't know what my, my colleagues are doing. Honorable Justice Faji, I thank you. You terrorized me very well when you were in practice and I knew what you did. Thank you very much. I hope you heard me. Okay, so those were the days when um, on Friday, I'm at the Federal High Court trying to reduce the My Lord, I said you terrorized me when you were in practice, sir. You used to arrest my well, ships on Friday. <laughs> I, <we can. laughs> oh, 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 well, your ships the ones that were yes, in. <laughs> okay, now I know. Yes, sir. Why you smiled at yes, me? Yes, sir. Now? So, but I was talking that about I reautomation <laughs> so that we can appreciate where we are right now. And those were the days when wolf rats or puff rat, pot rats, as you call them, operated freely in the pots. They were really the dark ages. I need to mention this because I put it in my notes. In 2002, a detective from Scotland Yard visited my office and he said he was investigating how a 40 footer container of a multinational flew out of the port. Said he flew out of the port. Needless to say, he went without getting anything. Those were the days. But I'm happy to report that when I investigated, even as I prepared this paper, I saw that all the agencies we have moved, we have moved, we have, we have gone digital, but what is the level of our digitalization when we compare ourselves to the ports of Lume, to the ports of Ghana? Don't let us go to Shanghai and, uh, and Singapore. So what is the level of automation? We will discuss that later and I'm, I'm happy that my other panelists had mentioned it. So today I'm asked to talk about the legal issues around automation of Nigerian shipping processes. Malam Bello, the very first point that came to mind, Malam Bello mentioned it, because it's like the extant laws are running behind technology. Technology is ever evolving and the extant laws are running to play catch up. If you check all our substantive laws in the maritime sector, I do not think that you would find any section that is solely dedicated to automation, even the revisions of them, not solely dedicated. So what we have is that we have to rely on the Nigerian Ports Authority and they are the regulators and we rely on them. And sometimes they even make proclamations and regulations that are not obeyed. In 2018, we got a directive from the Nigerian Ports Authority that all the port operators and terminal operators, terminal operators, we have to have at least a holding bay that can take about a hundred trucks. But what happened after that? Nothing. All the trucks moved back onto the Apapa route. So that's the first issue that I have to raise. We have to raise the fact that the extant laws are not as adequate. They are behind technology. And therefore, something must be done. And this is the place to start to do it. That's the first legal issue raised. And Malam Melo mentioned that. The second point is how do you determine liability? Now, this is very tricky. And I think it's a bit academic. I don't know if I'll take questions in that one, but I'll say it anyway. How do you determine liability in a fully automated port system? You know, he, the reason why we are going towards automation is to actually um, decrease human errors and human accidents. Let's say, for example, you have a cruise ship and something, something, fell, something fell in the in the ship. Of course, you will hold the vessel responsible. Okay, where we go fully automated and digital. And they tell you that, oh, what had happened, this particular incident or accident is not a result of any human error, but it's a result of technology. So where do we go from there? I'm sure if I put the questions out there, some people would say, of course, you, you sue the vessel. But what would the vessel do? The vessel says, okay, I didn't do anything. I'm going to go after the manufacturers. For Nigeria, this is a, 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 a future thing because they're not fully automated yet. But really, how do you determine liability in a fully automated port? We don't have it in Nigeria. There are no precedents, but it's a legal issue, and I felt I must mention it. I want to talk about cyber security and cyber attacks. Automation is founded on technology and therefore susceptible to cyber attacks. In fact, if you find that, if you Google now, you'll find out that a lot of the big shipping industries, they already have their problems with cyber attacks. What happens in Nigeria? I read in the papers that somebody in Kwara State hacked into a bank, a, server, a bank server in the United States. 
and did something. We call them Yahoo Yahoo. So if we go fully automated, how easy will it be for our systems to be hijacked? This is a question for all of us to answer, cyber attacks. If you remember in the days of Oluwole, there is nothing that was not printed out of Oluwole, bills of lading, custom papers. Are we going to go back to the same thing? Are we going to go back to the same thing? Cyber attacks. What can the NDC do or whoever is in charge to protect automation? And I'm not talking just shipping processes here, although because we are also thinking of other processes. So that is very crucial. I'm running now because we are talking about legal issues. We also talk about lack of steady network and power supply. Again, I commend the Nigerian customs. I commend your custom systems that you have launched. That portal is fantastic. It's working well. But it's also dependent on something. And what is it? It's dependent on steady network. It's dependent on electricity supply. Someone would ask me, is that a legal issue? In 2002, we had members, um, staff of Kenya Ports Authority visit our terminal. And in my conversation with one of them, the person said to me that in Kenya, the seaports and the airports must have electricity supply 24 seven. In fact, he said to me, it is a mutiny if there is a power outage in the seaports or in the airports. So can Nigeria have such provisions? Do we have the wherewithal to enact such legislations? Do we have the political will, the financial will, the technical muscle to sustain the implement, implementation of such laws? There's no doubt that when we are, when we are talking the digitalization or, or, or automation, we need a steady supply, um, um, supply in this country of electricity. We need steady network system. Are we up to it? Are we looking at it? This is very vital. Is it, is it a legal issue? It should be. It should be. If the customs have said that they would scan and they will get the containers out of the port in six hours, and this is not possible because of network issues, it means that we'll be subjected to um, um, the physical inspection that we were doing in those days. And you know what that meant? That meant, of course, delays. It meant loss of revenues and all. I must talk about the lack of a proper transport policy. I must talk about this is a topical issue. I'm very passionate about it because I work in Apapa and I go to Apapa every day. Section 32 of the Nigerian Post Act says that the MPA is empowered to regulate traffic within the port and approaching the port. Like I said, we've seen the MPA telling us giving us directives, do this, do that. But how effective is that? I don't know if my slides, you can show the, 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 the photograph of a papa, of a papa port today, a papa road today, just for you to see what we are talking about. Yes, if you are going out of the port, this is what you see. What I, in my position, see as the group council, I see a lot of claims for demorage. I see Nigerian shippers council calling me for meetings and, tell, and trying to mediate between me and the consignee because I'm charging them demorages, I'm charging them truck demorages, and they don't want to pay. And my company is not responsible for that. How do we solve that without a proper policy on transportation in this country? If we don't do that, we cannot fix the digitalization. What, what you see on our papa port, I want to talk real life now, is that you see that the MPA is not calling, they're not controlling the, the e-calling or whatever you want to call it, the call-up system. The call-up system we have at the port on the Apapa um, routes right now, it's devoid of any form of transparency. It is corrupt. My children will say to me, a papa traffic uh, pays better than Yahoo Yahoo. It means that the money made on that bridge, the money that should be going to the coffers of government are made on that bridge. They've called it military and paramilitary, and this is what you see. Why don't we have a proper e-calling system? Why don't it start now? There are things we can do now. There are things that we can do in the 25 years of development plan of the MPA. What can we do now? 
why do we not have a proper call-up system? This is very, very crucial because we'll be talking about issues of delays. These are the type of claims that we, we, we have. As a matter of fact, I think that the, the power of the MPA sits within the ports right now. I don't want to criticize the MPA, but this is the way I see it. This is the way I see it. I want to talk about loss of revenue. Ideally, when a, a vessel calls the port, it's supposed to drop its um, full container and take out empty containers. And doing so, you find out that the port is free. But right now, it's like the, uh, the ports are going back to the pre-concession days where you have block stacking, where you have congestion. Why? Because of accessibility to the ports. Of course, we are talking about lack of, lack of good roads, deplorable roads. You've seen an example of what, of, of what I showed you um, in, in my slide. So what, what, what happens when we are talking about digitalization? Something came to mind. I said, when we want to apply, for instance, to American embassy or most of the embassies, this is done online. You do your application online, you pay online, then you make your appointment online. On the date of your appointment, that is the day you go to the, to, to the embassy. Why can't we start a call-up system like that? And we can do it today because we have 25 years of development. This cannot wait. This cannot wait. Sometimes I'm afraid that a papa, port will, a papa roads and bridges will collapse. So let's talk of reforms very, very quickly. So what should we do? What can we do? I think we need an established legal framework, an established legal framework. And by that, I mean that there should be a comprehensive survey or a, an audit of all our processes. Technocrats should be invited from the maritime sector, from the IT. Let us work together. What we did in the past, copy and paste will not help us at all. We should not go to the port of Lome or go to the port of Shanghai and try and copy and paste their own uh, automation policy, no. Of course, we know that it will take us degrees and levels for the 25 year project that we want to do. So if we are able to do a comprehensive survey, then we can come up with a digital, uh, with a digital and a dynamic um, um, framework that can help us. We also need harmonize, harmonization. Um, the customs have spoken about it. Malambelo spoke about it. You see, right now, what you have is that some ports are better developed than other ports. So what we need is a standardization of all port terminals. We standardize the port terminals in terms of infrastructure, in terms of, um, of processes. And then we can have this single window. Something else also came to mind. If you missed your flight, for instance, you are on Air France and you missed your flight, you don't have to go anywhere from Air France. They're able to check the available flights for you. When they talk about single window, I didn't know that until I listened to um, um, Mr. Naji. I think this is where we need the standardization and the harmonization of all the authorities, of all the stakeholders to work together. And I want to quickly talk about political will. I don't know if we all remember in the days of Governor Fashola as governor of Lagos State, Trucks were built, truck parks were built, but there was confrontation throughout his tenure between truckers and his government. They did not want to stay. And they won, the truckers won. So we don't always, we won't also make the law. We will have to have the political will to implement the law. We have to talk about development and maintenance of our infrastructures. You've seen the condition of our roads. I hear now that the customs um, they, they have been funded. The NPA is being funded. We need to see this very quickly. I know that the real the real has started from a papa pot, but also COVID nineteen is to blame for the fact that it is going at a snail speed. What I hear when I made inquiries, and I hope it's not uh, uh, it's not hearsay, is that the work on a papa bridge is stalled because the contractors are not paid when they reach the agreed by milestones. So the, 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 when we are talking about development of infrastructure, we also should commit funds to technology because that is what we are talking about. I believe that the minister, the honorable minister of transport will take the lead in this and um, will, 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 will work with other stakeholders to ensure that we have 
we have a dynamic uh, transport system. I need to- Two more minutes, ma'am, sorry. Okay, just to talk about intermodal transportation and to say that I know that a bill had been submitted. I don't know whether it has been passed. So if we're able to develop our infrastructures, it means that we will have the roads working, we will have the rails working. And if, we, if there's a proper development of inland ports, then we won't have all the other, uh, all the other trucks coming to Lagos. I think we should look at this and, and that will be all. Um, I just want to say in conclusion that we cannot do this alone. All the stakeholders must come together. The government must have the political will to do so. And we must all, like we're talking about cluster, we must all come together, all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders to ensure that Nigeria is fully automated even before 25 years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Akibaboy, for a very, very, very interesting presentation. Um, you took us way back and gave us some insights for those of us that were not in the industry at that point in time. We just heard about it. Um, we heard my Lord, um, Justice Fati was very, uh, he knew what, he knew his stuff. So I'm sure our Fridays were very terrorizing for everybody. I was very night. happy when he went to the bench. <laughs> I won't say anymore. <laughs> but then you also gave us an overview as to what is obtaining in APAPA and, and uh, encourage all of us also to add to supporting them. I think political will is very important. Um, it's quite embarrassing the situation we have in APAPA. I can't put it in that way that we have a port and we are not able to organize truckers and get things out. But I think um, remedies are coming in with the transportation, with the rail, hopefully we'll get there. And also with a view to having the, you mentioned the transport policy, which I think is very passionate, is very important. Interestingly, yesterday, um, there was something we spoke about at a seminar organized by Mr. Dodo Murray, which they were talking about the need for a regime so for sustainable uh, a legal regime for sustainable shipping and the, one of the things that we spoke about on behalf of the president was the issue of not having a road network regime and also one of the speakers mentioned one for land transport it's important we also need to incorporate that with potentials of AFCA and regional movement to carry the goods by sea and things of that nature or land, as well as land multi-border transportation essentially um i would i would invite questions from all the participants. I have a couple of questions here for the panelists, and I'll just dive straight into that. And please, if you have any questions, please send them in. Um, there's a question here for Ms. Obiayo. Um, it's from Leonard Silk, Mike Ibukwesi, and it says, you have revealed that the Nigerian registered tonnage, you have revealed the Nigerian registered tonnage registered ship and cargo from Nigeria are low and have reduced over time. There, these are things which we worked studiously to enact capital act to grow. Why are we not there yet? Um, so beyond in the same vein, there's a question at um, um, put forward to you. Say, how many companies have benefited from the capital versus financing fund? Over to you, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Leonard Silk, Mike Ibokwe, I, I know how passionate you are about the success of the Carbon Act and have made tremendous contributions to the enactment of that act. But in debates on the floor of the Senate today, is as it relates to Nigerians not being able to participate effectively under cabotage and how those concerns need to be addressed because you all hear all the time that, oh, Nigerians do not have capacity. And as a registrar of SHIP, I make bold to say that we have Nigerian vessels that have capacity to work in the Nigerian oil and gas sector. The problem we have is that the same Nigerians are the ones who bring in these vessels and circumvent the law. And we hope and believe that with time, everybody is now seeing what it is and are agreeing to sit together 
to make sure that things work more in favor of Nigerians. We put up the marine notice, which will soon expire, and we're talking with NNPC and the OPTS, and everybody is seeing that you need to encourage Nigerians to be able to participate effectively. And if they don't have that capacity, that is why the fleet expansion committee is there also. And the issue of funding is very critical because for us, yes, Rome was not built in a day, but we must start from somewhere. So Nigerians should be encouraged to participate in the Cabotage Act. Otherwise, we will lose the essence of that act. And then the issue of CVFF, unfortunately, will be like I'm, I'm going to deviate from what we are doing here today. So let me leave it for those who, for those in government who have been addressing this. We have heard so much about it, and we know that all of these are work in progress because the implementation guideline had, had were, was reviewed and sent to the Honorable Minister of Transport. So everybody is interested. The ministry is very willing, but they want to ensure that it's done the right way. Unfortunately, no company has been given any money under the CVFF, none. Thank you very much, Ms. Obiano. Uh, Ms. Akibawe, I have a question or two for you from the panelist. Um, one is the first leg is that yeah, you, made, you said you made mention of a, um, someone from Scotland Yard yeah, that visited you. Now, can you please elaborate on the incident and how you were able to resolve that? And also, this is a question from another panelist, which was actually addressed, I think, to um, the, the ES of the Shippers Council, but I'm not sure if it's here. But I thought as a for someone who has been in port operations from agency to port operations for the last couple of years and seen the dark days to the days whereby we're seeing the light and hopefully we're almost at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> Excuse me. What would be your comment as to the Lekki ports? Since there's only one expressway leading to Lekki, are we not building in that, Papa? And what would you recommend that should be done? Because if there's only one way into that port at this point in time, you have the refinery and everything, it might be coming up in a couple of days, in a couple of years. Thank you very much. Um, let, let me take the first uh, question. Um, what had happened in that case was actually BAT, um, a 40 footer container um, flew out of the port. I mean, got missing from the port. It, was, it wasn't shown like the shot landed. It was landed and disappeared um, from the port. And I was sitting in my office when a detective from Scotland Yard asked to see me. You can imagine I was afraid. So he came in and was investigating and was investigating. Needless to say, it became a police case. That's the end of it. That's my response to that. <laughs> the, the, the containers was never found. It became a question of insurance settlement for my company. And that was how we, we resolved it. But um, that cannot happen now. Containers don't just fly out of the port. The second question is about Lekki Apapa Expressway. And you took the words out of my mouth by saying it will certainly be like Apapa. Certainly be like Apapa because we only have one road, the Lekki Express Road, going through from wherever to the Lekki Free Trade Zone. However, I wanted to make mention of this during my presentation. Because of the situation of the roads, <clears throat> we've started barging, okay? You see a lot of barges con um, controlling, um, taking containers from port to port or from one point to another jetty. That has not really really, but it is commendable and is a start. A start because it is a business that is now reserved for Nigerian businessmen. It is the um, concessionaires are not allowed to own a barge. So we see that developing. Of course, if it is automated, then it, there's going to be a call or something. But for Lekki Expressway, I don't, I don't know why um, they would put a port there without first thinking of the road infrastructures leading to it. Or perhaps it will only be budging from there. We wait until the coast is clear and we really know what they plan to do. But if it is just this single entrance, Lekki Expressway, we would certainly have a, a, a Papa route back on the Lekki Expressway. Thank you very much. Mr. Nadi, uh, we haven't forgotten you, sir. Um, well, there's a, the two questions for you, sir. And um, from 
uh, Mr. Abdullah, he wants to know that you mentioned that there are 30 parties and 40 documents in almost every transaction. Uh, can you please expand on that? Also, Mrs. Ndidi is in Okowa, wants to know that what are the importance of declaration in accordance with stripping examination? So essentially, I think what she's trying to say is that failure to false declaration, is there a criminal element to it? And what can she do that be done? She's from the Department of Public Prosecution. So I'm sure she wants to know how to prosecute in that area. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you very much. Let me start by responding to Mr. Abdullahi. Uh, basically, what I said is true. It's a low standard that is uh, following a research by United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. Uh, there are 30 parties that use 40 documents for a particular transaction in international trade, 200 documents for a single trade transaction globally, 70% of these documents are said to be reused at least once and 15% reused 30 times. Let me give a typical example. You are a Nigerian. So Abdullah, you are a Nigerian. You want to import, let's say, chemical fertilizer from foreign. Starting from the country, when you make requests that I want to import this, you request for pro forma invoice and so on and so forth. And I want you to imagine that same document, you go to a shipper, you go to the exporter, you go to the importer, you go to the carrier, you go to the terminal operator, both overseas and in Nigeria, and then you go to the terminal operator in Nigeria, the ship agent here, NAVDAC, SON, NDLA, SSS, Quarantine, banks, commercial banks, CBN, Ministry of Finance, who will give documents, you go to National Security Advisor's Office, who will give you end user certificate approval to import that because it's a precursor a chemical for doing EID. You go to customs to get your power. You pass through to notary public to get your combined certificate of value and origin. You go to Chamber of Commerce, maybe that's what they use. I've just listed more than 18 uh, 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 people that you go to meet just for this particular transaction. Now, suppose I, as customs, I will require document from all these people. I need their performance invoice. A bank also needs their performance invoice. NAVDAC needs the invoice. Everybody needs the invoice. SON needs the invoice. National Security Advisor needs the invoice. Just the invoice. The same document being circulated all over among all these people. So what's it? What Kyoto Convention and WTO uh, recommend is that this same document, if issued once, from everywhere should be respected. So if I am the first agency to receive a pro forma invoice, and I say that this invoice is genuine, have you received every other document that supports it? The other agency don't need to ask for it again, because if there's a single window platform, they would have seen it, that this other agency has received it, and it is genuine. However, remember what I said. It's about integrity. What Madam Adebanke just said now, in the days of Oluwale, if I receive such document and its trust, which I made reference to during my presentation, if I don't believe that that document is genuine, of course, I have to ask for my own copy to enable me proof. So the most important thing is that supply chain integrity must be upheld for a single window to be effective. If you give me a document that my own particular agency will compromise the integrity of the system, and I pass it to Sun or NAVDAC, they will query it. So here, we're not talking about the integrity of just the trader alone. We're also talking about the integrity of the suppliers, of the, of the regulators. So everybody must be involved. So Abdullahi, the question you asked, this is the basic explanation for it. Why do we have to repeat documents? You go to pay in the bank, for instance, custom, a bank issue you receipt electronically, on your way, other agencies, including customs, security agencies, every person, Lagos State government, everybody, they ask for the same document. Are you sure that this container you are carrying paid duty? Let me see the document. You are repeating all over. That's what we are saying here. So uh, it is a global challenge, but luckily it's being addressed uh, by uh, WCO and uh, WTO. 
in what I said is the, the uh, ensuring that there is transparency and uh, accountability in the supply chain and that there is standardization and simplification. Because another challenge you have is that some of these documents, you may bring it from country A. It is 10 pages because the legal proceeding is so complicated. And you bring it to country B, it's just one page. So it must be standardization. How do we make sure that the same document serve the same purpose? Even in matters of uh, nomenclature and the uh, language, you bring a French document. How do you interpret it without compromising the legal is, is explanations in that particular document for an English-speaking uh, person? These are some of that, what we are trying to clear. So there must be what we call a, in WCO in customs, a data model that should be able to interpret every document once you submit it in. So it will be like music. Once you hear the rhythm, you can dance to it without necessarily understanding the lyrics. That's what it's supposed to be uh, all about. Now, let me also uh, answer the second question about the legal provisions for false declaration. Of course, there is. If you make a false declaration, uh, it, your cargo will be seized in Section 46 of uh, Customer Data Management Act. If you make a, a false declaration, you'll be arrested and uh, prosecuted. But like uh, Madam Adebake said, sometimes if you make law be implemented, then that law is as bad as nothing. I will give you an instance. Uh, one of my uh, friends in the industry, Dr. Nebonan, said that every law should be a tolerable law. When the, most of the laws in the industry were written, they were written during the colonial days. <laughs> For instance, somebody takes a cargo out of the port illegally. You say the punishment for that person is 400 naira. So the incentive for that person to commit that crime over and over again, knowing that he's going to pay 400 naira, is higher. But if the laws are amended, for instance, to improve, which is what I said before, that Nigeria Maritime Law Association should help push for some of these reforms, particularly for our law that is hanging in National Assembly. If people like you who are advocates will go to National Assembly and say, we need this done, and there are so many juggernauts in the in maritime industry, the, uh, so uh, let me not mention names that don't sound too particular. But there are so many names that are recognized in this country that are voices that government listen to who are interested in maritime affairs, that if they come out and say, yes, this is what we want, these reforms in the industry, it will work. So, uh, Mrs. Sindidi, there are actually laws, and apart, let me send a note of warning. Custom laws are some of the most stringent laws in this country. If they are applied fully, our jails will not be enough to accommodate all the people inside. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Nandi, before you go, sir, I just had one clarification I wanted to make. Um, while you were making your presentation, you made a statement that um, that, that appears to be, and I'm, I am apologize if that's not the position, but that's why I wanted to clarify that scanning is not the way that if there's, because we make lots of declaration of cargoes here, now that means you'll be double um, scanning of the cargo, fiscal inspection will be required. So I'm asking, are you for scanners or are you saying that they don't, I don't know, they're not beneficial? And if you believe they are, they are, they are useful, is it not still better we have them that by the time a couple of people are caught and they're prosecuted, like really mentioned now, the issue of false declaration will stop and then efficiency level will kick in. Um, I thank you for clarifying this. Uh, I know that uh, this discussion is being recorded and uh, there are uh, people that will issue uh, uh, statements at the end of the day. And I'm happy that uh, you mentioned this so that I don't get misquoted. You know, we are civil servants, so that it doesn't look like uh, a headline. Custom says uh, scanners are not necessary. Please, they are very, very necessary. There are more than tools for cargo examination. All over the world, nobody talks about fiscal examination. But like I said, we are a developing nation. Uh, every economy, every society is a function of the products of what happens around them. Uh, what I said is that scanners are very desirable. They are faster, they are quicker, but they should be a function of the supply chain integrity too. That's what I mean. I'm not saying that it should be a, a, that a fiscal examination should be substituted for scanning. No. As a matter of fact, we have five lanes. Let me explain this. Is that uh, 
I didn't want to do the presentation here so that it doesn't take your time. We have five lanes for cargo uh, uh, intervention in customs, five lanes. The first lane is the red, which is what we use to uh, do fiscal examination when we suspect that 90% of that is suspected to be false declaration. There is a lane that is blue color, which we reserve for authorized economic operators, manufacturers, those that currently are manufacturing. We allow you to take delivery of your cargo to your warehouse and to your warehouse to examine that cargo. Those people don't spend more than two days in the port if the routes are free and they have logistics to move their cargo. So you have somebody manufacturing uh, bottled water and he brings his pet pallets, his pets inside the port. He's allowed, if he's registered with man, to take delivery of that cargo same day that the ship discharges it, having applied to his warehouse. And custom will go there and examine that cargo. That is the blue lane. We also have those that do correct declaration, like diplomatic uh, cargo, those that don't have anything else to hide, everything is genuine. You can take your cargo on that green lane. We have those that we do documentary check. We just check your document and say, okay, this particular one, there is a minor infringement, go for it. Then we have the scanning. That of scanning is also documentary check that we fail well, half, half. It could be that you are saying the truth, but let us check actually have provisions for people that if we, they do the right thing, we don't even need both scanning and physical. If people do the right thing, which is what uh, Dr. Hassan Bello alluded to, if from country of origin, cargo is properly declared that everything is right, we check you once, check you twice, check you three times, maybe over a course of one year, you are consistent with your declaration and you are right. We will allow you to go. Record that there was a particular company, for instance, permit me to mention this, that was enjoying the privilege of taking their cargo to their warehouse before examination. A reputable company in this country. Unfortunately, once we are caught bringing in uh, narcotics, if at that level you are caught doing that, what do you now do with unclassified importers? So you see that what we are advocating for here is supply chain integrity all over. Please, I'm happy you mentioned this. We are not saying that scanning it should, should be jettisoned for fiscal examination. We are saying that it is important, it is desirable, but where there is no supply chain integrity, it amounts to also to double examination because if I check the cargo, you declared 100 cartons, I check, I see 10, uh, 100 and 200 cartons, I want to check again. If you declare that you have uh, laptops and I check, I see laptops and television, I want to open the container to now confirm what is going on. So it amounts to double uh, check. The most important- Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the clarification. Uh, we have, um, we are running late and I think of one or two questions here for Mr. Kiboboye and Mrs. Obianyo. I would appreciate if we could have a prompt response to them. One of them, Mrs. Obianyo, is in relation to your responsibility under the Cabotage Act, like you mentioned, to register vessels for Cabotage trade. Um, the question is in relation to that, have you provided licenses as required under the law? And what is the guidelines for issuance of this license? And as it's also been required to be kept on board by the captain. So essentially, the, um, that is from Mr. Uh, Mr. Marshall, a former Director General of Nigeria, Nimasa, that wants to know exactly that Kabota that provides for license to be issued. And since the ship registry is responsible for registering these vessels, we assume you are the one responsible for issuing this license. And can you throw more light on that? Um, Mr. Akibo Boy, there's a question for you. I'll just take a bit. Can we respond quickly? I'm just asking that could be a question. Um, is what do you think is the solution for a Papa gridlock? And considering the potential for Lekki to be in that road, um, shouldn't you also be looking at rail other than just the budget? And those are two questions, and I'll share a quick thoughts so that we can move on. Um, okay, on the short term solution to Apapa traffic, I think there should be enforcement of the law. The people should be asked to go back to their park or their yards. That's the first thing. And we should quickly devise a registration for all trucks, a strong database. 
so that you, your truck is properly registered and then you can start a call from there. Um, I think the e-calling -call, e -call, e system should start by, by June if you're if you serious. But the first thing is that the parks must not stay on the bridge, but they must go to their respective yard and park there until called. And what was the second question, sorry? Oh yes, it's about Lekki Express. Uh, Lekki Express. Sorry, can, can you take the second question again? I didn't quite get it. Um, the Lekki Express, the question was that, based on your response earlier on that, um, it's, it has the potential to be in another gridlock like a papa, that yeah. they may be considering, government should be considering alternative modes of, um, of um, taking out the cargo rail as well, a real scenario. That, that is no question. That is a good advice. I don't know who can take it to the government. That is not a, that's the question. Of course, we should look for alternatives and we should start now. But I have a question for Mr. Dara, and I don't know if I can take it now. Mr. Naji. Please go ahead, ma'am. So we appreciate that. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Naji, there's a question that there's, there's an evil of some sort that I see on the bridge. When you're leaving a papa, you'll find your men again checking cars and checking cargoes. Now, this is a papa, this is by Leventis. This is a container that has just been gated out, out of the port. And then you find your men in clusters again, checking and causing traffic. I don't know if you are aware, and I don't know why they are there. But if they are there, I think you should look into that because it means that there's double checking. A container is just gated out of a papa and you find them in front of Leventis. I think you should look into that. It is good that you mentioned this. To answer you, please permit me to spend a few minutes to also request that customs should be recorded, should be commended for reinventing the badge movement, particularly in Canal Land Port. Uh, when I was there as a DC enforcement, we made every effort. See, having studied the roads since 2017, we found out that there was going to be breakdown of land order. And we, we did a memo uh, recommending that such operation should be approved. So now that we can't hear you, sir. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I said yes, that uh, I also wish to use this opportunity to request that uh, this uh, uh, discussion should commend customs for reviving the badge operation. In 2017, we noticed that uh, the roads were getting congested. And when we started the uh, cargo throughput over the years, we found out that by 2020, the road would have been witnessing what is happening right now. And we made a recommendation that badge operation should be revised. Initially, there were concerns about cargo missing and everything. The management letter agreed. And I'm happy that uh, we took that initiative, particularly uh, with Tinkana Land Port Command, where we were. Uh, then I, I held a meeting with some people. I'm happy Boloro is here, GMT, all of us. We held a meeting and we agreed. We developed a template. So you see the partnership between private sector and government. I sat down with GMT staff, uh, Bolori people, and we developed a template that we, there is need to revive badge. So it's good we recognize that. But let me also uh, answer the question that uh, you asked me now about uh, what is happening at the area B for this station. That has been a recurring issue. Again, it is a matter of integrity. The question we should ask is, much as we don't like that, a question is custom released cargo. The same custom is stopping the same cargo along the road. Why is it so? Several people have been asking this question. Why should custom that release cargo stop the same cargo along the road? International trade is about supply chain. You cannot legislate character. If Mr. Nadi is good, it doesn't mean that Mr. Dedoyi is going to be better. You can legislate characters. I may be a very terrible custom officer. So it depends on Mr. Dedoyi to also checkmate me. Within customs itself, we have some levels that is allowed all over the world. I don't like citing examples of foreign uh, uh, agencies, but over here in Homeland Security, you have CIA, you have these customs, you have this, you have custom border patrol, you have this, you have that, you have this. Nobody does it alone. Even within the CIA, there are also subunits. And that's what happens. But what we should be talking about here is not such operations. Is it proper for them to conduct such operations blocking the road? 
inconveniencing other road users. No. But we should also address when they conduct such, do they find out infringement sometimes? They do. You will not ask me if they find infringements, what happens to the customer that release the cargo and to the trader himself? They are being punished. What the society doesn't know is the number of my colleagues who have been dismissed for getting involved in some illegal activities. What the society doesn't know is those who are suspended for getting involved in illegal activities. Or the likes of clearing agents that have been suspended, or importers themselves for whose pin number and everything has been suspended from importing. We don't bore Nigerians by publishing those things. But the truth is that some of these interventions yield results too. What we should be advocating for here is that the approach and manner of doing that should not inconvenience other road users. Security shouldn't be physical. It shouldn't be too physical. It should be silent. You can even do what we call control delivery. If you suspect that this particular man is carrying something unusual, you can patrol to his warehouse and do that examination there. Of course, it is allowed. We have the law for it. Section 158 says you can patrol freely. The Section 147 and 148 also says you can go to the person's warehouse or premises and examine those cargo there. So I've taken note of what you've said. It's not the first time we're hearing that, and therefore it is being made to correct it. And we sincerely apologize for any inconvenience this causes to road users in Abapa, particularly considering that we have only one road leading into Abapa from that target. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nadi. Sorry, sir, there's a question that came in on the back of your badging comment. Um, I'm happy to hear that um, Customs was in the driving seat to push badging to be able to alleviate the extraction of cargo from the ports. But um, Leonard Silk and Funke was asking that there have been reports that some agencies have stopped and banned the using of badging and licensing and authorizations of issues are, are, are stalling this process. I recall a few weeks ago that um, I think Lagos State government stopped some vessels that were sent by the marina. There have been issues of licensing or badging. So if NPA or yourself can at least comment on it, I believe we still have Mr. Kabir on the line on the issues of um, licensing part of uh, agents or parties to be able to provide this badging. I don't know. Thank you very much, sir. A quick response would be appreciated. This is um, Abiyan, you're still on standby for the license question. Sorry, are they, uh, if MPA can respond, I saw a similar question on the platform here. Uh, say if MPA can respond, custom can respond. I don't know if you will permit me to do that briefly. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. The truth is that I like what Mr. Sadebanke said, that it is a beautiful initiative. It has helped. But that's on that the most important that that has been reserved for Nigerians to create employment, to add value. As I keep saying it, regulation should be separated from taxation. Don't use regulation as an instrument of revenue collection. That is very, very wrong. And that is what is happening now in that sector. When we initiated, or rather, when we said, let us revive this program, because they were using it before to move cargo from Tinkan to Kelty in those days of Bacolina. When we said, let us revive this, because it is in our law, coast wise, our intention was not to make revenue out of it. Our intention to was to face an immediate and expected challenge that will cripple the industry. The intention was good. But having seen that there are potentials for revenue in it, everybody is moving into it. The only person that's not making profit out of bad now is the Nigerian Customs Service. Every other person is making profit out of it. From those who turn their personal houses into jetties, to those who want to issue license, to those who want to regulate on waterways, to those who say don't come to marina, to those who say don't go here. So things in Nigeria, very beautiful programs, rather to be something that will help society to grow, be seen as opportunity for revenue collection. Until we separate revenue collection from regulation, we will continue to have problems. And that is where people frown at multiplicity of agencies in the port. Because an agency, agency is sent into the port for regulation. They turn into revenue collectors. 
and there is now multiplicity and the uh, 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 activities that one other agent has done, and that person is now coming to repeat the same thing. Again, single window will address all these things. And then enforcement of the law, the way it should be, will also address all these things. And this is where Nigeria Maritime Law Association will come in. Create this awareness, insist that the right thing should be done, irrespective of whose us is God. All agencies in the port have their laws and regulations. Don't turn regulations, don't turn activities that is not revenue into a revenue making uh, uh, activity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, Mr. Ben, over to you, just in terms of time. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Doni. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Omashe, my very dear Director General. I know you're very passionate about this industry the same way that Mr. Mike Ibokwe SAM is. Sir, on the issue of license, we are very much aware that the Cabotage Cabot Act provides under Section 15 that license should be granted to foreign vessels to operate in Nigeria and that such licenses should not exceed one year. Even the Merchant Shipping Act recognizes that foreign vessels can also trade under a time charter. But um, modalities for granting this license has been clearly spelled out under the guideline for implementation of Capital Tax Act. A lot of things have gone the way it should not have gone. But I am happy that the ship owners, the Nigerian ship owners, are actually living up to hope bringing this to the front burner so that we can begin to see how Nigerians are denied of tonnage. Because for me, as a registrar of ships, I stand solely with the Nigerian ship owners because if I don't, if I don't, the foreign operators don't add to my tonnage in any way. So I am not even happy to have them. So I need us, I need the ship owners for us to all come together, look at this guideline again, see where the bottlenecks are and ensure that even if we're going to grant this license, it is only when there is no Nigerian vessel and also for a very, limited time. So the, the law is very clear. It's just the implementation, sir. Thank you very much. I don't Blair. know whether... I think um, we spent... Um, um, the questions have been very insightful and the panelists have done justice to it. Um, we can continue speaking for the next couple of hours. There'll be a lot of issues. But it's clear that we need to automate our processes. It is clear that um, the word that was used a lot by Mr. Naji is issue of integrity. We need to be circumspect and determine exactly what we want for the sector. Um, it's a sector that is internationally recognized. We cannot start reinventing the wheel on issues that are clearly defined. And we're part of the community of nations. So as such, what automation will do is to enable us create some form of standardization on our processes and our requirements for the shipping cluster, increase efficiency, increase investors' confidence, and ultimately prof 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 profitability for the businessmen. On that note, I would like to thank all the speakers again, uh, Mr. Nadi, Mrs. Adibanke Kibaboye, and Nick Albiano for taking our time to present to us this afternoon. And we would, as Oliver Twist, um, call upon you very soon in the nearest future. If you do need your assistance, I hope you oblige us with your time and intellect. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think this is the end of the this panel. And one of the questions in the chat was, how is Nigerian Law Maritime Law Association um, assisting maritime law students? I think um, that is at the core of what we stand for, education, and uh, integration, please visit our website or reach out to any one of the members you know. We have a Young Maritime Law Forum, which is very vibrant and which we try and educate people and integrate people, not just from a legal perspective, but from a sector perspective. Um, brokers, engineers, everybody that's part of the cluster or the value chain. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, I'll hand over now to the anchor, Shayit. Please take it off from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doi and the panelists. 
I'm sure we've all had a productive outing, even though we're distanced physically. And, and it is gratifying to know that the number of participants has not reduced. That shows that you know, we are all enjoying the outing, the NMLA annual lecture. It's been quite stimulating. Without further ado, may it is my pleasure to invite Mrs. Funke Agbo, SAN, the first vice president of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association and the chairperson of the planning committee for this annual lecture and um, AGM to give us a closing remarks. Leonard Silk. Thank you very much, Shay. Uh, thank you much. Thank you very much for anchoring the program in such a deft uh, manner. Um, I think that this has been an excellent, excellent outing. I am really, really excited that this topic that we chose um, was is actually inspiring in the sense that we have learned so much. The word shipping cluster is a word that I have come to learn because of maritime clusters that exist in the Nordic countries in particular. In Europe, they have a deliberate maritime cluster that they seek to develop. In Norway and in Denmark, they have the same thing. And I don't see any reason why Nigeria being a coastal country. Yes, we talk about how many kilometers of coastal land we have, but we do have the coastal, we have the coastal um, borders. So, we are a natural maritime country, and therefore we have a shipping cluster. Um, Mr. Hazan Bello, our, our keynote speaker, set the ball rolling when he talked so passionately about automation in shipping. He said, what is a cluster? We know our maritime domain. He says we should know it, we should be conscious of it. And I think we are. I think that what we have discussed here bears that out quite clearly. We represent a broad, in broad strokes the maritime cluster here. And he has thrown out a challenge to all of us here. And I think all the speakers have said just as much that we have a lot of work to do. Yes, we have done a lot going from, from the past. And in fact, I know for a fact, and uh, I think a lot, number of people have mentioned it, the Nigerian Customs Service has really been in the forefront I know they've been working with Web Fontaine for many, many, many years, it's not today. I think part of the problem is that there's not enough information going around members of this same cluster in a way that would really, that we can appreciate and would push us forward. So we thank all our speakers, um, Mr. Nadi, in fact, the judiciary, the Admiralty Judiciary, the Admiralty Court is part of that cluster. And Honorable Justice Faji spoke to it. He talked about the things that they are doing. So we all need to work together. And that has been the recurring decimal in this program, that we need to work together. And we have thrown out a challenge to the Nigerian Maritime Law Association. And uh, we will take up that challenge. We will try to bring up together this maritime cluster. We will try to put our weight behind all the things that the different stakeholders are doing. It's a tall order, but I think it can be done. Um, Mrs. Zaki Moeboye spoke at length about the legal issues surrounding the supply chain, what needs to be done, where we are coming from, the dark ages, the cut and paste must be over. We are beginning to see that the MPA is doing a lot of work. We know that they are. I mean, they, everybody has challenges. I need to work. We stay in our silos. We need to work together, cross hands, work together. This is really key. The ship registry has told us what the how they intend to roll out the technology of the ship registry all for the benefits of this country. So all hands are on deck. We are grateful to all our speakers. We, we, I think we appreciate the problems. We appreciate the challenges. We also appreciate the ultimate good goal that we are trying to achieve and the ultimate results that will be beneficial for every one of us, every Nigerian in, that operates in this sector all the support, all the people who are going to benefit, the traders, the shippers, the stakeholders, all the services, consultants. I mean, it's such a huge, huge industry. Malambelo alluded to that. 
The maritime economy is a big part of the Nigerian economy, but we need to bring it to the fore. All the interventions that other stakeholders in other sectors are getting, we should look for how to get it as well. So on that note, I just want, on behalf of the planning committee of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, the president of the Maritime Law Association and the executive of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association and its members, I want to thank each and every one of you, our special guests, uh, Hassan Bello, um, uh, Justice Soho, represented by Honorable Justice Faji, um, Mrs. Uh, Hadiza Bala Usman, MD, MPA, represented by Mr. E.D. Kabir, Mr. Nadi from Customs, Mrs. Akim Boboye from SDV, Mrs. Neka Obiayon from the, um, from the, from the ship, Nigerian Ship Registry. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. And I think that uh, we will take the challenge um, up and uh, I'm sure that we'll all be better for it. Also, thank you, uh, Doing, for a fantastic moderation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you, everyone, for staying with us till now. But as we are preparing to wrap up things, may I invite Mrs. Omolola Alison Ikwagu to give us the vote of thanks. Mrs. Amalala Ikwagu was called to the Nigerian bar in 1998 and her practice spans litigation, arbitration, as well as corporate commercial law. She's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. She's a notary public and has worked on several groundbreaking cases. Mrs. Ikwagu is a professional member of the Nigerian Bar Association the Nigerian Maritime Law Association, the Institute of Trademark Attorneys and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. She has academic qualifications from the University of Lagos, 1992 at LLM. She, she has an LLM in 1992 and she was called to the Nigerian Bar in 1988. May I invite Mrs. Omalola Ikwagu to give a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, She. Um, thank you so much for the nice introduction. I was a bit taken aback when I heard I was called to the bar in 1998. But I see I'm you corrected sorry. that. <laughs> well, I, well, I see you corrected that. And so without further ado, uh, the Honorable President of the Nigerian Maritime Association, Mr. Chidi Ilogu, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, my Lord, the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, Honorable Justice J.T. Soho, ably and diligently represented by the Honorable Justice Ola Yinka Faji, the Managing Director of the Nigerian Ports Authority, Hadia Hadiza Bala Usman, ably represented by Mr. Edward Kabir, all other speakers here present, members of the Nigerian Maritime Law Ex uh, Association, ladies and gentlemen. I must also mention, I mean, recognize especially senior, distinguished senior advocates of Nigeria, then ladies and gentlemen, our sponsors, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It is my pleasure indeed to speak on behalf of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association to give these few words by way of vote of thanks. My work has actually been done for me, first by uh, doing Afun, secondly by uh, honorary, Honorable Vice President, Mrs. Funke Agbo San, and thirdly by our uh, able moderator, Mrs. Sheyi Adeju Yigbe, who have all at one time or the other expressed the thanks of the association. According to the esteemed American industrialist and business magnate, Henry Ford, anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80, and anyone who keeps learning stays young. I believe that most of us, if not all of us, want to stay young, and this Nigeria Maritime Law Association Annual General Conference and um, lecture has given us that opportunity because we have learned indeed, we have learned a lot. We have learned uh, valuable lessons and uh, we have been, we have been uh, told a lot about the different aspects of the Nigerian maritime industry and um, we will continue to learn. I must first of all thank Mr. Hassan Bello, Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Shippers Council. He told us that we should as maritime lawyers get crashed into many areas of endeavor, whether invited or not. Food for thought, gentlemen. 
He also gave us a definition of the shipping cluster along with our erudite SAN, Mrs. Funke Agbo, the first female SAN of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association. And he told us what an ideal cluster should be, stating that a cluster should be deliberated and should be deliberate and consciously built for ease of supervision and for coordination. He emphasized the importance of massive investment in the sector to ensure predictability and efficiency. Interestingly, and notably, he also called for this intervention of the central bank in the maritime industry, and that the, the intervention should not be limited to agriculture and mining alone. According to Ms. Bala Usman, automation will bring our shipping industry to become at par with other developed in, uh, countries and will bring to an end the regime of corruption and rent seeking and enhance efficiency in the maritime industry. And we are gratified to note that the MPA has reassured us all of their willingness to work with all stakeholders to ensure the achievement of all the laudable objectives espoused. The panelists, uh, uh, Mr. Dera Nadi, Deputy Controller of Customs, Mrs. Neka Obianyo, Registrar of Ships, Mrs. Ade Banke, Akim Boboye, Group Legal Council, D um, Bolo Transport and Logistics, in their various ways shed light on different um, of aspects of the uh, maritime industry. Mr. Nadi shed light on the operations of the customs and its important role and contributions to the full automation of the Nigerian shipping industry. He also emphasized the need to comply with international standards as Nigeria cannot continue to play locally. Compliant traders will get their, he informed us that compliant traders get their cargo cleared within six hours. Although he self appraised the Nigerian customs at 60%, Mrs. Akim Baboye raised the um, score to 90%. So we thank you very much, Mr. Nadi. And uh, we pray that indeed, as you have said, the automation will lead to reduced costs, increased prof increase profits, and also improved national security. Mrs. Obianyo spoke on the reform initiatives of the Nigerian Shipping Registry. She shared with us the dismal news that the whole of Africa contributes just about 1% to worldwide tonnage. On a more positive note, she gave us information as to how the shipping industry is coping with the challenges of digitization, especially in these times of the pandemic. Confidence in the processes will build stakeholder confidence. And she says that they, they, they intend to simplify registration, the registration process, improve decision making, and increase audit efficiency. I'm able to testify to the efficiency of the registry from a on a personal level, and also to the efficiency of the dedicated ship registrar's email. Well done, Neka. Keep it up. And then, last but not the least, I'll speak to Mrs. Adebanke Akin Boboye, Group Legal Counsel for Bolero Transport. She uh, addressed the legal issues on the automation of the industry. And in line with the other speakers, she said that automation brings efficiency, transparency, and accountability. That is where we need to be. Nigerian, as she emphasized the fact that Nigerian law has no section relating solely to automation and is thus behind uh, technology. She therefore called upon all the relevant agencies to make sure that we bring the law up to speed with technology. And she raised the issue of um, cyber security and the possibility of cyber attacks in the maritime industry. This is something that members of the association will know we have looked at in the past. She highlighted the lack of steady network and power supply and said it is a legal issue, giving us the example of Kenya, where indeed the airports and the seaports must have 24 seven power supply. She finally, she referred to um, section 32 of the Nigerian Ports Authority of the Nigerian Ports MPA Act, which actually empowers the ports to regulates the traffic around the area and uh, says that that law is uh, uh, more observed in the breach than, I mean, than in the enforcement. And so all the speakers, not only did you share from your wealth of knowledge in your prepared presentations, you answered the questions posed by our very attentive audience with immense aplomb. We thank you very much indeed. The able, moderate, the able moderators, um, Mrs. Sheyi Adeju Igwe and Mr. Adoin Afun, who kept matters flowing, we thank you very much. We also thank the attentive audience. You kept the, play, the, you kept the session interactive with your questions and um, you, made that, you made the session that much more interesting. Thank you very much. And my job will be incomplete and I will be remiss in my duties if I fail to acknowledge the immense support of the Nigerian Shippers Council, the Nigerian Ports Authority and the NIMASA. You have always been in our corner. We thank you very much. 
like a proverbial good child, we continue to count on you and we'll visit you frequently from time to time in the future. And so finally, I thank you all very much indeed for making this uh, uh, session wonderful. In spite of the pandemic, in spite of all the challenges posed, there were over 77 participants at this conference and I am personally gratified and I'm sure I speak on behalf of every member of the NMLA. God bless you all and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Ikuagu. Um, thank you very much. We all know that everything that has a beginning has an ending. So we're gradually coming to the end of the 2020 virtual edition of the NMLA annual lecture. And I would want to implore all the members of the Nigerian Maritime Law Association to please register for the AGM coming up at three o'clock. And if you've registered, please join us via the links sent to you. Um, as we round up, we would have to sing the national anthem. So I will invite us all to please join as we sing the national anthem. The national anthem. Thank you all and God bless you.